Honourable members, good morning. Let us pray. Guide, we beseech thee, Almighty God, with members of this house, that they may wisely deliberate for the good of this country and for the glory of thy holy name. Please join with me as we say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Pray be seated. Honorable members, this honorable house is now in session. Item three, oath of allegiance or of formation of a new member. Item four, confirmation of minutes. Leader of government business. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The speaker, I beg to move that the minutes of the proceedings of a sitting of the House of Representatives held at the Grenada Trade Center on Wednesday, 12th July 2017, be taken as read. Honorable members, the question is that the minutes of the proceeding of the House of Representatives held at Grenada Trade Center on Wednesday, 12th July 2017, be taken as read. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Of the contrary opinion say nay. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Leader of Government Business. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move that it said minutes of the proceedings of a sitting of the House of Representatives held at the Grenada Trade Center on Wednesday, 12 July 2017 be confirmed. Honorable members, the question is that the said minutes be confirmed. Those who have that opinion say aye. aye. Of the contrary opinion say nay. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Item 5, message from the Governor General. Item 6, announcements by Mr. Speaker. Honorable members, I was informed that Honorable Representative for the constituency of St. Andrew Northwest would be late has some urgent medical matters to deal with. I don't know that we had any other. Honorable members, I wish to advise this honorable house that the Committee of Privileges, as stipulated in the Fiscal Responsibility Amendment Act 2017, has recommended to the Governor General the names of the members of the uh, Fiscal Responsibility Oversight Committee. This committee that is comprised of five members is chaired by Mr. Richard Duncan. I am pleased to advise that the members of the FROC recommended receive the instrument of appointment effective the 23rd of August 2017. On that same day, the 23rd of August 2017, a familiarization workshop was held, and we were happy to have the governor, the governor of the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank addressing the committee. I would also like to advise that we would soon be meeting with the FROC to discuss the issue of cost for in relation to the functioning of that committee and the, the announcement. Item seven, 
presentation of petitions. Item 8, presentation of papers and reports from select committees. Leader of government business. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move that the following papers be laid on the table. One, report of the Director of Audit, Grenada on the financial statements of the Grenada Development Bank Small Business Development Fund for the year ended 31st December 2014. Two, report of the Director of Audit, Grenada on the financial statements of the Grenada Development Bank Small Business Development Fund for the year ended 31st December 2015. Three, annual report of the Grenada Postal Cooperation for the year ended 31st December 2014. Four, the annual Grenada Council for Technical and Vocational Education and the Training, National Training Agency, GCTVET slash NTA, the 2016 annual report. Five, the report of the Grenada Bureau of Standards for the year ended 31st December 2016. And six, the annual report of the Supervisor of Insurance of the Grenada Authority for the Regulation of Financial Institution, GAFIN, for the year ended December 31st, 2016. Honorable members, please be advised that these papers are laid at the table. Item nine, on opposed private business. Item 10, questions. Item 11, urgent questions under the provisions of standing order number 20. Item 12, statements by ministers. Honorable Parliamentary Representative for St. Andrew Southwest. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I just want to speak about one project of the ministry here today because of its importance. Mr. Speaker, this year we will be hosting the Agribusiness Expo right here in the Trade Center from the 28th to the 1st of October. The whole objective is to bring all the small business operators, those who are involved in small um, business as it relates to agriculture here in, and fisheries here in Grenada to showcase what they are producing in the small communities. We have a lot of persons, we have over 300 small business producers in agribusiness throughout the island, but they are also you know, all over the place, not organized. The objective of the, the, the expo is to expose them, to show their product, and to find markets for them. We have invited investors and mark, um, business people throughout the region and beyond, and we have had very good feedback. So we just letting the, the honor of this honorable house know that the expo will be right here at the Trade Center from the 28th to the 1st of October and we will be showcasing all our small agribusiness um, developers here on the island. Thank you. Honorable Representative for St. David. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I wish to report to this House and Labor Month that the activities today, 1st of September, Labor Month has been observed for the last seven years in the month of September. And this year, we have put on a number of activities in the ministry that will inform the public of the role and function of the Ministry of Labor. Ministry of Labor has a very critical role to play in the industrial climate in this country. And Mr. Speaker, as you observe over the last four and a half, ye four and a half years, we have had good industrial relations in this country. 
And that is due largely, Mr. Speaker, to the consultative process and the involvement of all stakeholders, the committee of social partners, engagement with the trade union on, on, on a number of issues. In dispute resolution, the ministry has been involved in, in mediating and in my role as Minister of Labor listening to various trade union disputes, and we have been able to settle it amicable. And that, that is good for the country's economic development and for confidence of investors when you have a good industrial relation climate. And so that must not be treated very lightly. Sometimes, Mr. Speaker, we seem to overlook you know, work with the Ministry of Labor and, and what it is doing and the overall contribution to economic growth and development. We have gone through a homegrown structural adjustment program very successfully that is used as a model for small island development states. And the Committee of Social Partners, the ILO, has described Grenada model as a model in social dialogue that they want to other countries to adopt. And we, and we have to be proud of these things, Mr. Speaker, and that is international organization, you know, the IMF World Bank, look at the homegrown structural adjustment program, the Fiscal Responsibility Act, and they are not recommending it. The Committee of Social Partners, the International Labor Organization, has rated it as a model of social dialogue. And I've invited Grenada in November, Mr. Speaker, to attend that international meeting in Greece to speak on the social dialogue model in Grenada with all expenses paid for Grenada to come as a small island state in an international meeting looking at Grenada's social dialogue model. And we have to be very proud of all the achievement, all that we have achieved over the last four and a half years. I think this team has done well. We have stuck to the task, and we have to continue. We are involved with negotiations with the public sector union for the one-off payment, which we are given a commitment that more will be considered, and more is on the table. And I say we are meeting with the union in a very amicable way. We hope to settle the matter and, and move on. Because this is a government that has said that people have made sacrifice and have offered monetary return for the sacrifice that workers have made. As you know, we have settled the first part and we do the second. We have settled wage negotiations going forward. First time in the history of Grenada, I have been in trade union movement for 20 years. First time government settled with the trade unions ahead of time. Three plus 2017, 2018, 2019, Mr. Speaker, have been settled. Because you know, Mr. Speaker, you've been in the trade union movement yourself when you created a union of teachers. Workers like to receive back pay. But that is the problem because the fiscal problem. We have to pay back pay of forty million dollars and fifty million dollars three four years back pay. That is that that becomes a burden on the state and on the government. And therefore, we saying let us settle these things before. So when January 2017 come, you're going to increase. January 2018, January 2019, you get your increase because it's already settled, and it becomes easier for the government to pay these increases and move on. Instead of having to worry about where you're going to find money and go right back to, this, to the place where you have to go into big overdraft just to pay back the huge overdraft. And now we have the Fiscal Responsibility Act. We cannot do that. You got the Fiscal Responsibility Act. Put a discipline, Mr. Speaker. The, the percentage, 9% GDP of GDP to wages and salaries. We cannot exceed that. It's there in law. And therefore, the fiscal discipline that this government has introduced, because only two independent Caribbean islands have this act, you know, Mr. Speaker, only Jamaica and Grenada. The other members have said to me in speaking that they will have it as a policy framework. But if you don't want to go in law, put it into law. <laughs> okay, you put it in law and you break the law. There are consequences. If we, for example, Section 7, of the Fiscal Responsibility Act, Section 8, Section 9, all said target. So you go and you, you, you didn't meet the target because of the way you spend. All the, the institutions have to do, the IMF and the World Bank, put out a statement saying that Grenada 
is not sticking to its obligation, to its laws, and are spending more than it's earning. And therefore, when the, other, the European Union and the other financial institutions read the report, they won't give you any money. Because if you, if you move out from the discipline that you set yourself and the law, then you, you are, you're penalized. You don't have to be taken to court. They just have to put out the report. And the significance of the homegrown program, just want to make this point because it seems that there is some misunderstanding. Said so we went to the IMF in a program for three years to get 21.9 million. 21.9 million US, Mr. Speaker, was the extended credit facility, which Grenada was entitled to. But as a result of going to that in the first year alone, we got $108 million in support. World Bank, European Union, and CDB. That is what we're talking about, you know. So because I re recall with the European Union and the, the C funds, for, they had to give us some, some grants in the first year. And the ambassador said they're waiting on the IMF report. They waited to see how they read Grenada's performance. And once the IMF report was published, then the money was released to Grenada. Because they said the IMF is the one that have the competence in that area. They are not the ones, so they are looking at what they say. And every year, for the three years, we got money under the program for successfully implementing the structural adjustment program. But Mr. Speaker, the real point, as I said when I started out, is just to highlight, I know I, so, I will soon have a lot of time, just to let the public know that just from the 1st of September, we, will be we are celebrating Labor Month, and we want the general public to give their support to the Ministry of Labor in Labor Month. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Minister for Labor. Item 13. Yeah, just. <laughs> Honorable Representative for Carrie Court, Peter Martinic, and Minister for Legal Affairs and Foreign Affairs. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, let me begin by congratulating all the students who have done so well in the CXC exam that came out recently. But in particular, Mr. Speaker, I want to extend sincere congratulations to Shaniza Steele from Caracol, Hillsborough Secondary School. 15 out of 15 to 12 grade one. Mr. Speaker, I also want to congratulate Mr. Jesmond German Emmons for topping the CAPE exam at the Tom CC campus in Caracol and Peter Manning. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, this did not happen in a vacuum. It's not, it, it didn't happen by, by, by error. It was a total effort on the part of many agencies and personnel, starting with the government, that has really laid the foundation by providing meaningful assistance to these youngsters to help them to achieve or to reach where they are today. Also, the parents, Mr. Speaker, had played a meaningful role, principals and teachers, etc. So this whole thing about education, Mr. Speaker, is something that just more than meets the eyes. And so when you have a strong and committed government in terms of providing education to your youngsters, of course the result is not the result is not unexpected, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, in terms of infrastructural development, I am pleased to say that quite recently some one thousand feet of concrete drain was constructed in Lauriston, which had been a serious problem in the past because when it rains, pedestrians, the, the, the motorists could pass. And now the work is well done. I want to, of course, congratulate the contractor, Mr. Abraham Pope, for having done a very, very successful piece of work. Mr. Speaker, of course, contract is out for the completion 
of that road. Mr. Speaker, at Bellevue South Road, that is a road that I'm sure everybody heard while we were in Parliament for all these years. Finally, we are in the last phase, and this road will be completed very shortly, Mr. Speaker. <coughs> Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, of course, there are many more roads to be done, as we know, but with limited resources, we have to take the priorities first. But I really want to announce that we intend to asphalt the, the Dover Top Road, the Bella, yeah, the, Bo the Bella Hospital Road, Bogus Road, and PM Road. Mr. Speaker, there is a pending danger in Pedemanic and both in Caracol as well where we have serious rockfalls, and especially when it rains. Quite recently, Mr. Speaker, there was an incident where a big tree fell and injured about two persons. Mr. Speaker, we all know that the Ministry of, of Works extremely burdened, and so we are trying to find some ways to uh, engage an independent contractor that will really help Mr. Speaker in concluding this work. Mr. Speaker, Tenders also out for the Dumfries Road. This Dumfries Road is a MARAP project, and I want to take the opportunity to say thanks to MARAP because they've been helping much. So the Dumfries Road tenders are out, and very soon, Mr. Speaker, I'm sure that we keep that going. Tenders are also out, Mr. Speaker, for several other pieces of, of road. Mr. Speaker, On the social development, Mr. Speaker, people of Caraco and Pedemani cannot complain that they have not been receiving their fair share under this government. As a matter of fact, I, I cannot imagine of any other government that would do so much in such a short time for our people. I really want to say thanks to my colleague, the Prime Minister, of course, for this assistance. Mr. Speaker, over 225 persons received uh, vouchers for uniform for this coming school year. 150 persons repair, uh, receive house repair uh, materials, and of course those who benefited from um, the needy assistance program, Mr. Speaker, that have been working very, very well. So many people who could not otherwise afford in terms of health, education, welfare, etc., have been benefiting under that project, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the port facilities in, in, in Trill Bay is, is on track. I mean, if you go down there and you look at it, it's like the whole area is already uh, transformed. Uh, uh, property around that area, uh, the value has shoot up. And so, Mr. Speaker, I'm sure when the facility is over, it's completed, all of us will be justly proud, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the, the Chinese housing, of course, um, I, I understand that it will be accelerated very soon. And so that people who are interested in benefiting from the Chinese Houses program should start sending their application to the Ministry of Caracol and Pedemonic Affairs. Uh, Mr. Speaker, lands. I want to make a special mention of this. Mr. Speaker, you know for many years, the issue of land distri distribution has been pending, government after government. And so, Mr. Speaker, I want to make a commitment that before the end of the year, the persons who had um, um, been designated for government lands will receive their, 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 their papers before the end of the year. That's, that's my commitment, of course, to the people, and we'll make sure that happens. Mr. Speaker, of course, water, I didn't want to go into details because um, I've mentioned this many times, but, but there, are, like, there are extra monies now being given to expand the program so that every household in Caracol and Pedemanic will have, will have water. Mr. Speaker, I do not think I will be crossing the line in terms of separation of powers if I take this opportunity, Mr. Speaker, to welcome, to welcome a new justice of the High Court that arrived in Grenada uh, two days ago and was sworn in yesterday. And uh, Mr. Speaker, this justice is no stranger to Grenada. Because he served here, he served here, Mr. Speaker, as, as he, he served here as Chief Legal Counsel um, in 2004 to 2006. So he is now joined the rest 
and he'll be going to the civil division, Mr. Speaker, which would be of a very good help for us. But, but, but Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, justice does not come cheap. Justice does not come cheap. And I know that the government has a real compelling interest in making sure that justice is done. And so the government is putting its money where its mouth is. And so this additional justice, of course, will cost the government a pretty sum. But we believe that, that of course, there are no um, uh, amount too great to pay for justice, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, as you know, the court system has been clogged up and a lot of backlog in the court system. This mainly because um, people become more litigating in their approach. Um, at one point, of course, people would just sleep on their rights. But now, it seems that everybody knows his or her rights, and so they file their action, and so the court is there's backlog. And Mr. Speaker, this additional judge, or this additional justice would, would of course, um, help us to remove that backlog so that, of course, justice could be given to all those who enter the courts. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Honorable, Honorable Representative for St. George Northwest. Or you give way to St. Mark. Honorable Representative for St. Mark. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Not only should ladies be first, but also the PM usually picks up the rear very effectively in case we miss anything. So I would rather go before. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise to communicate information on the ministry that has been entrusted to me, the Ministry of Tourism, Civil Aviation, and Culture. Mr. Speaker, I want to start off with Spice Mass 2017. While the, the, the numbers are still being counted, but based on preliminary numbers that we have from Grenada Tourism Authority and from our airports, we are told that this is the largest number of visitors that Grenada has had ever for Carnival, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, tourism did its part in assisting to market Carnival, this our great festival, within the region and also externally. We had five international, over the period, we had five international press promoters. We hosted them here so that they can um, look at what we do for Carnival and to spread it around regionally and internationally to bring more people into our country. Mr. Speaker, the administration of Sanders told me that for the first time they had people, they had um, guests who booked specifically for Carnival. Those guests came to play mass and they, they purchased their costumes online. We have gone international with IT, Mr. Speaker, and Grenada is now attracting not just Grenadians back to play carnival, but persons from the region are coming here, and also internationally, guests are coming in specifically for carnival. This is good for our band leaders. We need to um, advertise a little bit more on social media and whatever other IT means are necessary, so that hopefully 2018 will be even bigger and better than before. For the first time for Carnival, uh, Spice Mass brought in children from Karku and Pity Martinic to perform the iconic Shakespeare Mass. And that was well received. The children came, and that was in keeping with our mandate and our commitment to promote the culture of Grenada, Karku, and Pity Martinic. And we hope to do much more of that in. In other occasions, occasions other than Carnival, but also to do more of that for Carnival 2018 and beyond. I want to commend the Grenadian people, our people, on their conduct, our behavior. We had no serious incidents, no serious crimes, and you know the, there was a, a video of, 
of one of the reporters from Trinidad being circulated high in praise for Grenada. He even spoke very well of the police, but he said that the police, they, they didn't even have weapons or anything, and um, there wasn't the need for that. Peace, safety, and stability are critical to our country, and our people are exercising just that, Mr. Speaker. So commendations to our people. So our carnival went very well. Um, I would take, like to take this opportunity through you to compliment all the winners in the fancy mass, in the traditional mass, and so on. They did very well for themselves. And we, um, in the Ministry of Tourism, Civil Aviation and Culture, and government will continue to give support to um, all of those activities. Mr. Speaker, we are all aware of the situation with the steel ban, the, the, the postponement, or the cancellation, rather, of the steel ban competition. Um, we were all distressed by that happening, um, especially where it concerned the children and the others who had practiced and who had planned for this competition. And we are taking measures to have dialogue with the Stilburn, the association. They have presented to us something which they had promised the former Minister for Culture a long time ago, an MOU, which we are perusing so that we can get to some agreement to sign that will guide our conduct between the culture between culture, sorry, the conduct between culture and between steel band. We know there are some gripes and we are moving in that dialogue to explore the, 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 the problems that we have and to look for me means to improve on it so that not only around carnival time will we recognize Tilban as part of our culture, but year round we will create more activities so that the players can exhibit the skills that they have and feel proud of it and so that they can encourage more locals to have interest in steel band and to, um, to patronize the steel band um, during competitions, Mr. Speaker. So we are all working on an amicable relationship and an amicable solution to <coughs> the, 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 the plight of the steel band cancellation. And um, we apologize for the inconveniences caused and we are going to work aggressively. We will not wait for the day of panorama, but we are going to work aggressively and collaboratively with all of the stakeholders so that come over the year, the year between now and Carnival 2018, we will have more steel ban activities and we'll be really ready and prepared. One of the issues was the, the, the lack of a stage and we have given the commitment to ensure that we've have a state purchased so that it can be used at other times, but certainly will be available for Carnival. Mr. Speaker, our stay over passengers for the first year, for the first half of this year, January to June 2017, it increased by over 5%, Mr. Speaker, in that first half, over 2016. We had an increase in of 10% in arrivals from the United States, 9% increase in arrivals from Canada, 7% increase from Caribbean um, people, and a whopping 33% increase from Germany, Mr. Speaker. And this is a reflection of the aggressive marketing that Grenada Tourism Authority has embarked upon, especially in UK, because we had um, experienced a downfall after Brexit and, and after the devaluation of the pound and so on. And now we are moving speedily to address that situation so that, uh, and we've seen the results of the increase, but we will not rest until we have maybe double or three times the numbers that we have seen, and we're all happy for that. And I want to, through you, Mr. Speaker, compliment the Grenada Tourism Authority and all of our agents out there who are working assiduously to market our island. Mr. Speaker, we are aware that there has been a decrease in, in, um, in, in the cruise industry. 
not a decrease in terms of the numbers of the ship, but ships that come to our shores, but we have had a decrease in the size of the ship, and yet that has affected negatively our numbers. So we have taken a number of steps, Mr. Speaker, to ensure that we address the situation. We have been working on that for a long while. Um, we have paid up our, our dues to FCCA so that we can be platinum members again, and so Grenada, um, Grenada is now a platinum member, and that gives you access to certain meetings and certain facilities that you do not get if you're not a platinum member, so that we'll have full access to all of the cruise ships, all of the cruise lines that are part of FCCA. Mr. Speaker, also, we have invited a high-level delegation to Grenada from the cruise lines, um, consisting of the head of the FCCA and um, head persons in Carnival Cruise Line and Royal Caribbean Cruise Lines. And they were, we gave them a tour. They looked at our country. They were quite pleased with it. Some had never been. Some had, uh, were visiting Grenada for the first time and so did not, you know, were not aware of the beauty of our country and the pleasures that they could have visiting our countries. They, um, they gave us some ideas that we worked with. That patient, the freedom of movement, it can be conducted in their own home. It can be, it allows them to travel, Mr. Speaker. So it's not just a reduction in the cost of health care to those who need dialysis, but also an improvement in their lifestyle that we're able to provide. And Mr. Speaker, as of yesterday, we had an indication from St. George's University that they will be joining us in the provision of this service to increase and improve the service that we deliver to the public with respect to peritoneal dialysis. Mr. Speaker, doctors, the ministry in collaboration with the Ministry of Education and in particular our various partners, government and people of Cuba, Go, uh, the St. George's University and others continue to, to train as many doctors as possible. In fact, this year the numbers have increased. Last year I know there were 16 doctors that were given scholarships. The numbers continue to grow, Mr. Speaker. We have negotiated with SGU for an additional four doctors to be trained on scholarship this year. Mr. Speaker, we have signed off with the government of Cuba with respect to continued engagement and scholarships, as well as the provision of medical services by the government of Cuba to Grenadians in need. But Mr. Speaker, I want to address the issue of doctors in particular, and to take this time to recognize the service that they provide, to take this time to recognize the sacrifice of a nation in educating them, and those who have received that education that turn around and provide that service to the nation because the goal of the government in giving a scholarship is not just to educate Grenadians in the field of medicine, but to educate Grenadians in the field of medicine so that they will serve the nation in the public service for a time. And then, if they wish, they can move on, Mr. Speaker. So I encourage and congratulate those doctors who have received this award, this sacrifice by the nation, and have turned around with that gift that they have been given, with that privilege that they have been given, have turned around and continued to serve this nation and make sure that they serve out their time at the general hospital, at our district medical offices, and throughout wherever the nation calls on them. And look forward to having more individuals like that step forward to give service to the public, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I want to congratulate the Royal Grenada Police Force and the Spice Mask Corporation and all involved. From the Ministry of Health standpoint, Carnival was a slow period. There were no major events, no major health risks, no major damages, no major accidents. And I think that is a testament to the organization and the security forces and the structures that were put in place, in most cases behind the scenes subtle that we would not have recognized. But I think Royal Grenada Police Force needs to be congratulated and the Spice Mask Corporation. 
Mr. Speaker, the Ministry also continues and has completed the first phase of the regularization of nurses and has embarked on the second phase engaged with engagement with Department of Public Administration and the Unions and Nursing Association, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we also have engaged now in a process of hiring additional orderlies, much needed orderlies, and members of the public who access our health system will begin to see the positive effects of those additional orderlies. Mr. Speaker, whatever achievements I may be able to speak of within this House, I need to recognize those who make it possible for me. And Mr. Speaker, today I want to recognize one individual in particular, the Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Health, Ms. Pauline Peters. Mr. Speaker, since she has joined the Ministry of Health as a Permanent Secretary, her first stint of being a Permanent Secretary simply would like to say in this House that she has brought an attitude a level of proactiveness and a level of focus that is being felt not just by me as a minister, but by the entire Ministry of Health and I believe the nation as they access health care, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, I take this opportunity to encourage other senior members of the Ministry of Health to follow in the footsteps of P.S. Peters. Many of them are. Many of them have led before her to provide human service, but still like everywhere else, Mr. Speaker, there may be one or two who are not fully on board in nation building, who are not fully aware that the provision of health care is actually the saving of lives, and that the delay in that provision or lack of e effective efficiency in that provision may risk a life, and it may be their life that they risk, to encourage all to be involved and all to follow in the footsteps of P.S. Peters and the other senior members of administration within the Ministry of Health who are pushing forward and leading and being true public servants or servants to the public, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, in closing, I would just like to also follow in the words of my sister to say that I too look forward to the very imminent passing of a bill that will restrict, if not ban, the use of styrofoam in Grenada that will protect our pure Grenada, our environment, and allow us to continue to enjoy this beautiful country. Mr. Speaker, I thank you. Thank you, Honorable Minister for Health. Honorable Minister for... Don't see me. Did our government business? <laughs> oh, Honorable Minister for <laughs> Agriculture <laughs> and Fishery. Good morning. Mr. Speaker, I know I'll be brief. I only have uh, three things to talk about. I know we have a full day. Yeah. The, the first one, uh, Mr. Speaker, is that very soon we'll be installing the fish aggregating device, which is called FAD, on the western side. So I just, and that FAD, this, this one we want to have the local fishermen build it and install it so that we wouldn't have to get people from Japan to come to maintain it. So this, I want the fishermen to be on the lookout, be ready, because that would be starting soon. And also, we would have an increase in fish production, so I would like the nation to continue consuming more fish rather than imported chicken. The second one, uh, Mr. Speaker, is that hopefully by the 18th we, we would have uh, someone joining us to deal with fish, the quality of fish landing. And we'd also have some help from the Japanese regarding uh, the training in uh, pre preparing the fish for the sushi market. We also, Mr. Speaker, have a company in England that wants us to send one tuna to, to London so that they could analyze the quality that we have. And if this works out good, there'll be a new market that we would have established. And uh, finally, Mr. Speaker, I just want to take this opportunity to wish a very proud son of the soil and also a proud son of uh, Gov St. John's, that's Kirani James, on his birthday today. May he have a very happy birthday 
and continue to make us proud. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Representative for St. George. Honorable Representative for the constituency of St. George, Southeast. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I wish to provide a very, some very brief updates with respect to the construction department of the Ministry of Works, Mr. Speaker, and to compliment a beautiful young lady from the constituency. First, Mr. Speaker, the practical completion of the 1,500 feet of the St. Patrick Brick Water Project, which cost $4.62 million, Mr. Speaker. And the positives include the accumulation of beach sand, the return of the beach, the <coughs> increased use of the dockings of small vessels, and the increased use of the beach by the villagers, Mr. Speaker. The substantial completion of the Warvey Bridge in St. Patrick's, with the two approaches to be completed at a cost of $550,000. The Bellevue Concrete Road, Mr. Speaker, is substantially completed. That is the section that is under construction. There was a side visit by the Indian Commission, Mr. Speaker, who was very delighted. And very soon, the representative in that particular area and the Indian Commission will be organizing, Mr. Speaker, an opening for that beautiful bit of road, Mr. Speaker. The, the, the government of India provided $800,000, Mr. Speaker, but what we have done so far is in excess of $1.2 million. The procurement process for the construction of the works in the St. Patrick Road network, we have been talking about that for a long time, Mr. Speaker. The consultants are on board. They are prepared to tender documents, and it will be out shortly. So we expect within the period of uh, three months, 90 days, Plus, we should have a contractor on board. And with his mobilization period of nearly 30 days, it's approximately four months, Mr. Speaker, looking at the normal process of things. Expression of interest has been invited for the Western Main Road Corridor funded by the UK Safe, Safe Fund, Mr. Speaker, part of the 300 million pounds given to the region by Britain, Mr. Speaker. So, as soon as the consultants are on board, we'll be having design and we'll be doing projects after projects, Mr. Speaker. The normal three months tender um, program to tender and the normal one month mobilization. So after that, Mr. Speaker, we should see work commencing and many of the projects along the Western Main Road. The consultant has been mobilized for the design and supervision of the agricultural feeder roads funded by Kuwait and OPEC, Mr. Speaker. So he, again, the same process, 33 months plus mobilization period. So we're all looking at a significant amount of construction work to be started, Mr. Speaker, after four months. The Holy Cross School, the work is going there. And the problem there was that the contractor was selected, funded by the World Bank. The contractor got many other jobs, and so it was deemed part of the job, part of the other job that he get was a grant. And UNOPS had indicated that the person doing that must not be in any way, have any loophole to facilitate financing from the grant to do any of the other works. So the World Bank working with UNOPS, and UNOPS is in Washington close to the World Bank. We had to retender. We have someone on board, and the work is progressing smoothly. I know a lot of people in that area were disturbed because of the start and the non-start of the pro project, so to speak. Retrofitting work, Mr. Speaker, the asphalt road maintenance work continues to cost the date. Remember the supplementary budget just um, came along, Mr. Speaker, and so all the others that we have in place are being paid for now, and we'll start in the many areas, particularly St. David's and some places in St. George and St. Patrick. So asphalt work will be continuing, Mr. Speaker, at an improved pace. The road maintenance debushing, close to $8 million, Mr. Speaker. That provided some 3,980 persons per fortnight. And not because we have four fortnights, we'll multiply by four. Because in some areas, some people get two fortnights, and in other areas, some people get one fortnight. So a factor is somewhere around 2.8 to three. So Mr. Speaker, we're talking about some, if we just use three by four, we have about 11,000 persons who would have benefited from the program, Mr. Speaker. The procurement process to invite tenders for the construction of the Gov Medical Center. This has now commenced. It's financed, Mr. Speaker, by the EU. 
bus routes and bus route stickers, 114 new applicants, 122 replacements. Right. And this is an area, Mr. Speaker, it shows that comments have been made of the increased quantity of vehicles on the road. The ministry has already started uh, it's to look at how will we deal with this through the road um, traffic management systems and other areas. Increased number of vehicles we must provide. Looking down the next 10 years, we must plan for what we will be doing with our roads, Mr. Speaker. That is why it is so critical to conserve, as Minister Joe spoke about it, Mr. to conserve and ensure that the country remains on the right economic path so that we will be able to provide the solutions to all of this, Mr. Speaker. What continues on the Houses of Parliament at a cost of $23 million plus a $5 million that we are looking for now, Mr. Speaker, to ensure that we do all that needs to be done. Yes, it could be occupied by the members of Parliament, but you will still look at the landscape outside. There will still be some unfinished business that you will hide and nobody will see, but we are looking for the funds, Mr. Speaker, to make sure that all has been completed. And now, Mr. Speaker, without removing from the achievements of those other persons mentioned in the CXC and CAPE examination, Mr. Speaker, I must I must make special mention and congratulate Ms. Jamaica Shelley Donald, who hails from St. Paul, Mr. Speaker. She topped the CXC with 15 subjects, 12 ones, and the three twos. The best that the island has seen, Mr. Speaker. And we really are extremely proud of her, Mr. Speaker. And more so, it's a very humble young lady of great character, and I really want to express my congratulations also to the parents from whom she would have inherited all her beautiful traits, Mr. Speaker. And if you look at her just walking through the community and the village, everyone will be extremely proud. Mr. Speaker, the school also, as was said, must be congratulated for being part of the team that gave her this success, Mr. Speaker. And she was rather surprised as so many other people. Whenever the Anglican High School is having a function and they ask for all past and um, present students and past and present teachers to stand, and well, I stand, you know, you can see the little young ladies in the there. What is he doing? What is he standing there for? They did not know, Mr. Speaker, that most of the prowess of the students in the Anglican High School, with respect to mathematics and science, Came through your humble servant, Mr. Speaker, and obviously it was brought from a school that excelled in those areas of science and mathematics, presentation, Brothers College, Mr. Speaker. So I am extremely proud of the young lady, and so is the community, so is the constituency, and all of Grenada from what we have seen, we respect the congratulations that have been that have been expended to her, Mr. Speaker. So on this note, I would like to finally and fully express and further express every good wish for her and continued success in our endeavors. Thank you, Honorable Minister for Communications Works. I want to make, I want to make sure. <laughs> it's a very short announcement, Mr. Speaker. Um, Mr. Speaker, it's known that we are working aggressively to attempt to solve an old age-old problem that is the issue of pension for public servants, which as you know, we inherited as the Act, Pension Disqualification Act, was passed by the revolutionary government in 1983 and subsequent governments over the years, including former NNP governments and NDC governments, did not solve. But it's government, so we accept our responsibility. So we're not blaming anybody. We have taken up our responsibility and recognized the deficiencies and the problems that has created that that 
has created and has been in consultation with the trade union body representing the workers. Um, but Mr. Speaker, the problem is such of such a magnitude is not something that you can just wave a stick and have solution overnight because the worst case is that if we agree on some formula to deal with the problem and then we cannot meet it, then you would have raised expectation unnecessarily um, and, and created an even bigger problem for you. And this government has shown that it has been very careful in the decisions that it makes. And therefore, we've been working with some, to some extent, the union leadership have expressed an element of frustration, a feeling that we should move much more aggressively. And I could understand their position. I would, if I was in their position, I would also want to. But we are in a position which is quite different while agreeing with them and, of course, supporting their position for the need to, to deal with the problem, as we have announced in true speech and budget speech and other speeches. We do have to recognize that we have a responsibility to, to, to the country as a whole. And, and therefore, we are moving. And now we have set up officially a pension secretariat, which would be, of course, staffed appropriately with the necessary professionals to, ensure, to speed up that process. So, Mr. Speaker, I make the announcement here tonight, today, to inform that, in fact, that secretariat has been established. In fact, up to yesterday, we held another meeting examining how we can proceed. So we continue to, to seek the support and understanding of the trade union leadership, as they have demonstrated over the last four and a half years, as the labor minister articulated so well the whole consultative process and the whole issue of um, social partners working together, which is so well accepted and want to be emulated regionally and internationally. Mr. Speaker, in the same context, therefore, we've been working and have, in fact, done a number of regularization of public servants and teachers, an issue that has plagued governments and the public service for years. The past government did absolutely nothing about it. On our structural adjustment program, there were limitations, and we promised at the end of the structural adjustment program that we'll move aggressively to deal with that issue. The Minister for Health mentioned a while ago, Mr. Speaker, the number of nurses that have now been regularized over a couple hundred or more hundreds of teachers, if I'm correct, Minister of Education, former Minister of Education, then I'm, I'm, I, I believe that um, we have done an enormous amount. And in many cases, it's costing millions of dollars, Mr. Speaker. And I'm stating that because everything we do, whether it's pension, um, increases in pension, whether it's regularization of teachers, whether it's, it's regularization of public servants, nurses, and other public servants, whether it's one-off payment for public workers, back pay for public workers, increases in wages for public servants. Mr. Speaker, it must be understood, it comes from one part. So we cannot discuss pension increase in isolation of one-off payment. You cannot have all the one-off payment that you want. <laughs> all the pension increases you expect to get, all the increases in wages that you expect to get, all the other benefits, allowances, and whether it's um, 
whether it's clothes allowance, whether it's travel allowance, all the other stuff comes from one pot. So the government has a fundamental responsibility not to just take care of one group of persons in the country and forget that we have the marginalized, the poor and vulnerable, the young people who are out there, out to now without a job, some without hope. We have to provide hope and in some cases spend enormous amount of sums of money. In the money program that we continue to do, announcement a while ago from what was made concerning the additional business, um, I heard it on, on radio this morning, the Minister of Youth announcing this over 100 and something young persons who are trained into small business enterprises and have given, been given loans to start businesses. And I think it was 130 mentioned and 120 already have taken up the offer. In other words, enormous amount has to be spent in so many areas. The poor and vulnerable, the homes are some with the weather and the rain wetting. We have to find the resources. We cannot tell them we do not have money to even make sure they don't get wet in their homes. At the same time, we can do what we have to do for some particular workers in the system. And I'm not just talking about the public servants, talking all. In other words, Mr. Speaker, we, in dealing with wage increases, one of payment, rest, regularization of teachers, public servants, the pension increases, and all these must be done holistically because it only comes from one simple part. So Mr. Speaker, the point made by the Minister of Labor a while ago is extremely important because what we, we see happening with the image of the country regionally and internationally, and it's well known because I have to keep turning down invitations to travel, to speak to audiences regionally and internationally about what, how Grenada's economic transformation. In fact, ambassadors and diplomats come into my office in the last few months, particularly after the completion of the program, the structural adjustment program, have been saying over and over, whenever they visit prime ministers and ministers of finance, they, they're always using Grenada as an example of what they would like to see their own citizens accept. In other words, because the trade union movement here, the business community, the churches, leadership, the NGOs are working with government. They're saying they would like to see their citizens have a similar formula because they believe it has worked enormously to the benefit of all the citizens of Grenada, Caracol, and P.D. Martini. And the point is, Mr. Speaker, if give Given that we are seen as managing ourselves and conducting ourselves responsibly with the Fiscal Responsibility Act, Procurement Act, and all the other stuff, integrity legislation, and all the things that the Minister of Labor mentioned a while ago, if we do anything, Mr. Speaker, that sends the opposite message, the next day, Mr. Speaker, all fall down. In other words, let's suppose we make a decision that says that Grenada owes now a billion dollars to public servants. The next day, Mr. Speaker, all fall down. Because in other words, Grenada has now have a debt. The debt to GDP ratio will balloon overnight. And that has enormous implications for the fiscal responsibility of the country, enormous implication for the image of the country. So what we would have achieved in four and a half years, overnight it will be destroyed. Mr. Speaker, we cannot overstate this point because all of us have to live in this country. All of us have a fundamental responsibility to create the best atmosphere and condition for our children and grandchildren. And no matter whether we call ourselves politician, prime minister, minister, trade union leader, business leader, what, whoever we may be, and what designation that we hold in the society, we all have a fundamental responsibility 
to the peace, stability, and of course, the good order of this beautiful country. So Mr. Speaker, I, I make this point for what it's worth. But I just want to end on a, a, a note. Note, Mr. Speaker, it's well known that I am a foremost critic of the present administration of West Indies cricket. I don't hold that back. And the point I make is consistently proven. I've always said that the region produces and continue to produce talented cricketers. It's just that we have not harnessed those talents, and that's why we're in the, in the problems, the problems that we're experiencing at this particular time of our history. Because, Mr. Speaker, the facts are, when every tournament that the West Indies participate internationally, whether it's under 15, under 19, we're always in the top three. And, that, and as I say this, the under 19 West Indies team is captained by a Grenadian, a Karakunian, with a stirred talent, a lot of talent. In other words, the talent is there. Why then, after winning on the 15 competition, on the 19 competition, when they get to the test level, we are in the bottom? So the talent is there. And therefore, I just want to compliment the two talented Caribbean cricketers for the excellent display of batting technique that I saw watching that game in England, where they were facing some of the best fast bowlers the world has in, in James Anderson and uh, the, um, the other gentleman, <laughs> the name leaves him at this point, Broad, yes, Broad. It's two of the best under English conditions, maybe not under Australian conditions, but under English conditions where the ball moves around. To play against these bowlers under, under cloudy weather and to make, to, to have the kinds of innings that they had to end up winning a test match in England, first in 18 years, um, I think we all deserve to give them enormous praise, Mr. Speaker. And I want to be the first leader to, uh, the Caribbean to come out saying all praise to the young cricketers and to the West Indies team. I hope and pray that that performance continues. And I hope that they ignore the other problems that they have to come up with and face all the time with the administration and concentrate on the, on the, the performance and make us all proud as Caribbean Carib cricket fans once again. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Prime Minister. Item 13, personal explanations. Item 14, motions. Leader of Government Business. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, I beg to move the motion standing in the name of the Minister for Finance. Resolution for the purposes of Section 107 of the Representation of the People Act, Cap 2, 186A, which reads, Whereas it is provided by subsection 1 of section 107 of the Representation of the People Act, Cap 286A, hereinafter referred to as the Act, that the Governor General may make regulations generally for giving effect to the provisions of this Act, 
whereas it is provided by subsection 2 of section 107 of the act that regulations made under the act is subject to affirmative resolution and whereas regulations have been made to provide for the insertion of a new symbol to be used on ballot papers in the representation of the people election symbols regulation cap 286a and whereas it is now expedient that the representation of the people election symbols amendment number two regulations to 2017 attached here to as a schedule be approved by the house of representatives now therefore be it resolved that pursuant to the provisions of subsection two of section 107 of the act the representation of the people election symbols amendment number two regulations 2017 be now approved by the house of representatives All right, members, the question proposed is that pursuant to the provision of section, subsection 2 of section 107 of the Act, the representation of the people's election symbol amendment number 2, regulation 2017, be approved by the House of Representatives. Do you have government business? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, this is the normal procedure of including symbols on the ballot paper, which is provided for under the Representations of the People's Act, as, as Section 107, Subsections 1 and 2. But, Mr. Speaker, the Act requires that any such inclusion, any amendment in the regulation will require affirmative approval, which means it must come to the House of Representatives and be approved before it can be gazetted by the Governor General. We had such a resolution passed not too while ago, Mr. Speaker, and I think the symbol at that point in time was a clenched fist. Today, Mr. Speaker, we wish to include in the regulations one, two, three, four, Mr. Speaker, symbols. And the regulations, simply, very simple. They are the citation, the principal regulations, and amendment of the schedule to the regulations. So if we simply read, Mr. Speaker, a section two of the regulations that are being requested for approval here, it says that this, the schedule of the principal regulations is hereby amended by inserting the following symbols to be used on ballot paper immediately after item number 30. And item number 30 is the last one that we approve, which is a cleansed fist. So we want to include, Mr. Speaker, the symbol, the waterfall. We want to include the symbol, the flying red horse. So 31. In the regulation, when it's amended, it's 30 now. So you see how many symbols we have, Mr. Speaker, you now for elections. 33, that's the third one, is a gem. And it's a shape like a nice diamond shape with a hexagonal, pentagonal, the diamond shape system. And the fourth one is the banana, Mr. Speaker. So now we are amending the regulations to, instead of having 30 symbols, we'll have 34, Mr. Speaker. While we do this, Mr. Speaker, which is um, very simple, and uh, members will give the view, and I don't believe that anyone will be objecting if somebody comes up and say to the Governor General or the Supervisors of Election, I want to create a party and I want to run, and I want to be able to use the particular symbol. I think the regulations are very clear. It is still up to the Supervisors of Election to see whether or not that symbol could be used or should be used or would be given to a particular political party or independent candidate. But Mr. Speaker, I have simply draw the attention to this honorable house where one, two, three, the third preamble, which says, whereas regulations have been made to provide for the insertion of a new symbol to be used on the ballot paper. The legal person is there. 
should it be new symbols? We're talking about four. Or uh, we know the legal terms could mean when you say a new symbol, perhaps it covers all four. I just raise it here, Mr. Speaker, so that the legal people could really look at the third preamble. Outside this, Mr. Speaker, I simply want to recommend that this Honorable House approves the inclusion into the regulations of these four symbols. We do not know, Mr. Speaker, at least I do not know who presented them, from which political party they came, whether new or from which independent party. I think we are not really concerned with this. We just simply must approve. That's the work of the supervisors of election and the Governor General. So we are recommend to this Honorable House that we approve those symbols for inclusion and to hear what the legal department will see, whether we should make an amendment to preamble number three. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Leader of Government Business, just before we make it the inquiry, could you again repeat those symbols? Thank you. I'll repeat the section. The schedule of the principal regulations is hereby amended by inserting the following symbols to be used on ballot paper immediately after item number 30. So what is there, Mr. Speaker, will be 30 symbols, item 30. So item 31, with a new symbol, will be the waterfall. I 32, a new symbol will be the flying red horse. <laughs> 33. The new symbol will be the gem. 34, another new symbol will be the banana. Thank you most kindly. <laughs> I know that in the resolution, there was something that marked election symbols. So that is, now therefore be it resolved that pursuant to the provision of subsection 2 of section 107 of the Act, the representation of the people's election symbols, amendment number 2 regulation 2007 be now approved by the House. Would we still require I know in, in three markets, there were all election symbols. So would we still need to get the legal nod on this? Just, uh, Mr. Speaker, it's more or less a, it's a grammatical error. If at the beginning, we, here we're talking about four symbols. Yeah. But it says, whereas regulations have been made, which are the said regulations that we're talking about, to provide for the insertion of a new symbol. But we are inserting four new symbols. Well, I'm simply asking whether a okay. new symbol is a legal term that legal term encompass term. four symbols. So it's really a great, the resolution itself is, is, is correct. You know, it says yeah, about four. Yeah, yeah. But it's just a grammatical thing in the preamble that I'm just asking. Right. May I inquire? May I inquire of the our legal team, if we can proceed with the resolution as is, or if we need to make any slight correction. Leader of Government Business. Yeah, Mr. Speaker, just as um, I had in the back of my mind, it's a uh, in the legal interpretation, the legal, the singular, could mean the, the plural, could be interpreted. So a new symbol does not go against 5 or 10 or 15. could be 1 up to 15. That's what um, the legal persons are proposing. Thank so the preamble could remain as is. Thank you kindly. Honorable members, the question is that pursuant to the provision of section 2 of Sub, sorry, subsection 2 of section 107 of the Act, the people's representation of the people of the Act, the representation of the people, election symbols, amendment 
Number two, Regulation 2017 be approved by this House, by this Honorable House. Those who have that opinion say aye. aye. Of the contrary opinion say nay. I think the eyes have it. The eyes have it. Honorable Representative for Kari Kwan Piti Martik and Minister Thank for... Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move the motion standing in the name of the Minister of Finance. Resolution for the purpose, purposes of Section 9 of the Foreign Nationals and Commonwealth Citizen Employment Act, Cap 115. Whereas it is provided by subsection 1 of Section 9 of the Foreign Nationals and Commonwealth Citizen Employment Act, Cap 115, herein after referred to as the Act, that the Minister may make regulations generally for giving effect to the provisions of this Act, whereas it is provided by subsection 2 of Section 1 of the Act, that regulations made under the Act is subject to approval of Parliament before publication in the Gazette, and whereas it is now expedient that the Foreign National and Commonwealth Citizen Employment Amendment Regulation 2017 attached hereto as a schedule be approved by Parliament, now therefore be it resolved that pursuant to the provisions of subsection 2 of section 9 of the Foreign Nationals and Commonwealth Citizen Employment Amendment Regulation 2017 be now be approved by Parliament. Mr. Speaker. Oh. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Honorable members, the question proposed is that pursuant to the provision of subsection 2 of section 9 of the Foreign Nationals and Commonwealth Citizens Employment Amendment Regulation 2017 be now approved by Parliament. Honorable Representative. Mr. Speaker, this amendment seeks merely to insert in the principal act a revised work permit application. Mr. Speaker, on this new work permit application, of course, an applicant must now prove three things in order to be granted a work permit. First of all, the applicant must prove to the Department or the Ministry of Labor that the skill which is sought to be filled is not available on island. In other words, someone appears or applies for a work permit for a driver. Obviously, when the application comes to the ministry, the applicant will have to show why he or she wants a job that might be available and can be done by a local. So they must prove, number one, that this skill is not available at all. So you're looking for a rocket scientist of somebody of that nature, and Grenada doesn't have it, fine. But if you come for a driver, Mr. Speaker, there are plenty of drivers in Grenada. And so you must prove for us, of course, that the skill, or the persons with the skill, are not available in Grenada. That's number one. Number two, Mr. Speaker, the applicant must also prove or show to the Ministry of Labor what efforts had been made to recruit a local. So in other words, you will have to prove to the Ministry of Labor that you've made some concerted efforts to recruit somebody for that position, but of course, you couldn't find that person. And so, Mr. Speaker, these efforts must be documented. You cannot just come to the ministry and say, well, I, I do this, I do it. It must be documented. So you must show, I interviewed X, Y, and Z for the position, which is locals, and find that they are not competent or there are, there are no persons able to do the work. Or, of course, you have to s demonstrate that you have put ads in the paper, in the newspaper, or radio announcement, or what have you, but you must show that effort had been made. 
and so that the Ministry of, uh, of, of Labor will be convinced that before they hire a foreigner, of course, the, we, are, we do not have the locals to do the work. And Mr. Speaker, the final one is, of course, the applicant must show what measures will be put in place to train the locals so that eventually they would replace the foreigner. Mr. Speaker, this, this, is not, this is not something that is new. It is something that most countries do in order to protect their own nationals. In the great United States of America, for instance, if you want to get a job in order, let's say a sponsorship, remember that, of course, you had many persons at the time who were applying for uh, a domestic job to take care of kids or to cook clean, what have you. And then they first had to apply to the Ministry of Labor to, to get this classification. And the Ministry of Labor, you have to provide to them documentation. You have to show them that you advertise in the paper maybe three times a week or what have you, and cut the clippings from the newspaper and send it to the Department of Labor so that you could show that you made some effort before you get a labor certification. So this is not something new. Mr. Speaker, I believe that every government has a compelling obligation to protect the rights and interests of its citizens, employment included. And so this move, of course, to protect our, our locals is, 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 nothing, is nothing new, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, and of course, in, coming, uh, in, in making the application, sometimes there are a lot of trickery. I can remember in my tenure in, in Ministry of Labor, um, an application was made for a driver. And when I said, well, wait a minute, we have so many good drivers in Grenada. I mean, they, they traverse the, the steepest um, terrain in Grenada. They're very good. Of course, you have one or two not so good ones. And what happened, the application was denied because we could not in good faith give a foreigner a job as a driver. When we have so many people here, especially in, in this um, competitive climate for employment. And what happened is the applicant made a turnaround and come back and submit an application, same person for a chef. And I had to say, well, you know, you got to try a while down because we have a lot of good chefs here. So you got to look out for the tricks. They would just change around and come. But we have an obligation, Mr. Speaker, to protect our locals and a continuing obligation of that. And so this new and revised application for work permit form is exactly to protect our nationals. And as we notice, as I said, a continuing obligation because even when you grant a work permit to a foreigner, it is not forever. That foreigner must also prove that, that, that efforts are being made to train locals. So the whole thing is to, is to give your own people the preference. Mr. Speaker, as I might say, Grenada and Grenadian first. Mr. Speaker, that, 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 that is the essence of all this. So, Mr. Speaker, I don't think that anyone could have any, any, any problem with, of course, approving this resolution because, Mr. Speaker, um, it goes to the heart of our obligation to protect our citizens. Uh, Mr. Speaker, of course, the um, Section 9, Subsection 1, make provision for the minister to to amend the regulations. But then section nine, subsection two, also said in order to do this, of course, you must get the approval of parliament. And this is why, Mr. Speaker, we bring this resolution here um, this morning um, so, that, so that we can get the approval of parliament. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honorable Representative for St. Patrick West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise to give my full support to this bill, the, the proposed change to the regulations. And to say, Mr. Speaker, that while I consider it to be necessary um, I do believe that it may not be sufficient for uh, 
to provide the level of support and protection for our local workers. But this is a step in the right direction, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we all know that there is a significant skills gap that exists in our country where you have high unemployment coexisting with um, critical skill shortages. And unless measures are taken first and foremost to improve the skills content of our local labor force, the temptation to bring in foreign workers under various pretexts, Mr. Speaker, will continue to exist. And it is a fact that some employers will bring in will use the excuse that we do not have the local skilled labor to bring in their friends, their relatives, and other persons who feel they want to bring in in order to take the jobs that our locals may be able to take on or with the necessary training might be able to take on in the not too distant future. And therefore, Mr. Speaker, by making this revision, I think it will help to mitigate this temptation. It will help to reduce the high level of un unemployment among our own people. But at the same time, Mr. Speaker, I believe that unless we have better monitoring mechanisms in place, this may not be as effective. And the monitoring, Mr. Speaker, in my opinion, will require some time frame. Fine, you said that you will train locals, but over what period of time? And you can use the, the excuse over and over, well, the Grenadians are not ready yet. We've been training them, they're not ready yet, so they can't take on the job. So we must put some mechanism in place to ensure that some time frame or some level of qualification will be required that can be monitored. So if you require a CBQ or NBQ, that must be monitored over a period of time. Otherwise, the excuse will be used that well, we're training them, but they can't learn, they're not, and you know, that is one area, Mr. Speaker. And the second area of weakness that we have to correct is that in the absence of penalty, and the penalty could take various forms, for those who fail to adhere, even to the new requirements, what do we do? If you are given a certain time frame to train the local for a particular job, and you, you refuse to do that, what is the next step? Do we extend the time, or do we say, well, you will lose X, Y, Z, you will lose certain concessions? I believe, Mr. Speaker, we can strengthen this by um, requiring some penalty to be imposed um, where employers fail to comply with the new requirements that our people should be trained to take the jobs that are available, and there must be exhaustive search, <coughs> extensive search, Mr. Speaker, to ensure that the skills they are looking for are not in these available locally, Mr. Speaker. And that's the comment I want to make with regards to this. But I fully support this change. And I think it's a step in the right direction. Thank you, Honorable Representative for St. Patrick West. Honorable Representative for St. David. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, I rise to give my support to the motion as Minister of Labor, we are a number of applications is approved on a weekly basis for foreign and commonwealth nationals to work here. This form was prepared to address the concerns just raised by the Minister from St. Patrick's West. Because in the new form now, it will be in the regulations, and so you could not monitor. So I agree with you, it needs to be monitored. So we could now monitor. Because the work permit is usually issued for one year. And then they come for renewal. 
So he said, in one year, you must have this person trained or seek to get locally qualified people. So that when you apply next year, we will then go through the interviewing process with you to determine what have you done or what you intend to do because you come for the renewal. This, so this will strengthen the hands of the labor officers in ensuring that what we outline in the form of the skills that are available and the training that is necessary, we will have control over that by putting this um, into regulation. So it gives the officers the power with this new um, form. Because there is one category that is abused a lot, Mr. Speaker, there is one that says it could bring in managerial, technical, and supervisory staff. So you have some institutions, some businesses, every application you see, they put manager. Mm -hmm. But you know how many managers you could have in a business? Because the, 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 he says you could get some managerial, supervisory, and technical staff. So this, now, this, we, under this new regulation, this new, we can deal effectively with such loophole but we just categorize people. There are certain standards you must meet and certain requirements you must have to be a manager. And therefore, this is coming at the right time and I therefore give my full support to this motion. Thank you, Honorable Representative for St. David. Honorable members, the question is that pursuant to the provision of Subsection 2 of Section 9 of the Foreign Nationals and Commonwealth Citizens Employment Amendment Regulations 2017 be now approved by Parliament. Those who are of that opinion say aye. aye. Of the contrary opinion say nay. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Item 15, bills. Honorable Representative for St. David. Mr. Speaker, I beg to introduce for first reading a bill for an act shortly entitled Grenada Citizenship by Investment Bill 2017. An act to amend the Grenada Citizenship by Investment Act Number 15 of 2013. Honorable Representative for St. David. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move that the relevant standing orders of the House be suspended to enable the bill to be taken through all the stages at this sitting. Honorable Members, the question is that the relevant standing orders of the House be suspended to enable the bill to be taken through all the stages at this sitting. Those who have that opinion say aye. aye. Of the contrary opinion say nay. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Honorable Representative for St. David. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move the second reading of the bill. Mr. Speaker, this amendment, there are some simple amendments that have been put forward to this bill. And these amendments were proposed in order to keep in line with what exists in the, this industry. As you know, we have a citizenship by investment program that the IMF has reported as the gold standard for the rest of citizenship program. The due diligence, very thorough, and we ensure that only the right people get into the program. So the amendments, Mr. Speaker, I'll go through, look at the Simple amendments, so I'll take it one by one and give the explanation for each one. Amendment to Section 2 of the Principal Act is amended as follows. In the definition of dependent at paragraph C, delete the word 26 where it appears and substitute the word 30. Mr. Speaker, this is done, this Amendment increased the qualifi qualifying age from 26 to 30 for dependent children who are studying, disabled, or otherwise dependent on the parent for support. That is what the simple amendment move. You move it from 26 years as a dependent to 30. 
in section 2, A2, insert the words or his or her spouse after the words supported by the main applicant where they appear. The main applicant, <coughs> Mr. Speaker, here, will now, under this amendment where you have his or her spouse supported by the main applicant, you want the words to say supported by the main applicant. At paragraph E, you have to delete the word 65 where it appears and substitute the word 55. What does symbol? It lowers the age of dependent from 65 to 55. That is all this amendment is doing in this section. In C, by inserting after paragraph E the following new paragraph. F, a child of the main applicant or his or her spouse who between 18 and 30 years of age and who is otherwise dependent on the main applicant or his or her spouse. That is the new thing. All this does, Mr. Speaker, is to amend the definition of dependent to include a child of the main applicant or his or her, or her spouse aged between 18 and 30 who is otherwise dependent on the main applicant or his or her spouse. That's the changes that um, is recommended there. Insertion of a new 5A in the Principal Act, Mr. Speaker, with the following new section. Inclusion of newborn child and application of main applicant. Why is this necessary, Mr. Speaker, in the new amendment? Saying that the child must be born within 12 months of filing of the original application. So someone file an application for citizenship on the CBI program. And say the child must be born within the 12 months of the filing. The main applicant, upon paying a prescribed fee, you can apply to the committee. The committee, within six months of the birth of the said child, to be deemed as the child as having been included in the application. The applicant is required to submit an original or duly certified copy of the birth certificate of the child and any other documents that the committee may require. After review of the application, the committee shall make the appropriate recommendation to the minister. That is the effect, Mr. Speaker, and it's the effect of the uh, recommendation. The amendment to Section 8 of the Principal Act, subsection 3 of Section 8 of the Principal Act is amended as follows. In paragraph E, by deleting the word or, where it appears, by deleting the comma at the end of paragraph F and substituting therefore a semicolon, by inserting after paragraph F the following new paragraph, G, is denied citizenship by investment in another Caribbean jurisdiction. All that simple is doing in this new amendment is saying that an applicant that was denied citizenship in a next Caribbean country will be ineligible for citizenship under the Grenada program. That is the purpose of this amendment. So Mr. Speaker, these are very straightforward and simple amendments, mainly dealing with the children and spouse and the age, the, two, the, the main things that ages for dependent has dropped and the age for dependent children has increased. That is the main purpose of these amendments, Mr. Speaker. I thank you. Honorable members, the question proposed is that the bill be read a second time. Honorable Prime Minister and Representative of St. George North West. Um, as the minister responsible for citizenship, I just want to stand to give my full support to the second reading of this bill, as the member for St. David's pointed out. Most of these are simple amendments meant to ensure that we remain very competitive in this important area. Um, it does not in any way injure the program. And the point that was being made that it places in law the section that ensures that if someone is refused citizenship in another jurisdiction, that person will 
be in, in ineligible for citizenship in Grenada. But let me make the point, Mr. Speaker. Whenever we have any information of any such person without this being in the act, we have refused those individuals because the, the, the security checks done by our FIU and our security agencies offering support on the security aspect of this program has been excellent. And they pick up information and our FIU, even when some major countries' security apparatus has given a plus to an individual, officially so, the FIU has sometimes picked up information that has that's indicated that that individual can be problematic and therefore we have not proceeded to give citizenship status to those individuals. So I think it's important for us and in fact the, uh, the IMF report has said that Grenada's citizenship program has been the gold standard for a citizenship program in the region. So when the IMF makes a statement like this, it's clear. And it, evidence has shown that the, we have had very little problem at all has been raised. In fact, any time there's been an issue raised, it has proven to be one false, and it has proven to the fact that our program has stood the test of times. In addition, Mr. Speaker, We have heard some comments made about our program by elements that cannot see anything good about any initiative of this government. Elements that have been rejected totally at the polls by the people of this country who have been stating that we have some serious issues of the problem of the CEO and the problem related to um, the person recommending citizenship to the government and to the cabinet and to the minister. The individual or individuals in making comments as wild comments as they are accustomed to, have not even read the law that they sat in parliament and were able to see and comment on. Because while other countries' law says the CEO is the one who recommends to the minister by implication the minister in cabinet, our law says a committee of the CBI program of the board is the one that recommends to the minister, not the CEO. Even if it's there, the committee presently, the board overseeing the program, goes through every single application And our com the committee of the CBI comprises professionals who certainly, whose credibility have not been questioned by even those individuals. And they go through every application, in fact, <coughs> Many of their meetings have gone for four hours, three and four hours, Mr. Speaker, because they look at the, the documentation for every single application. In fact, a soft copy of all the checks on every single applicant is sent 
to the Prime Minister's office, the office responsible for national security. So if any issue is raised about anyone, the documentation is there, sent by the, the CBI committee who is approving, uh, recommending the approval of this particular um, applicant. So, Mr. Speaker, we are confident that our program is yielding enormous results. I think the reason, the only reason that those elements who are bringing up, making these statements about the program, the only reason they're doing it, Mr. Speaker, because as usual, anything that brings resources to this country, any initiative this government takes that brings opportunities, investment, employment, and, and development and economic activity, they will oppose it. They have never supported one initiative, never one single initiative that this government has in fact come forward with that has been responsible for enormous opportunities in the country. Even in securing the country, they have opposed it. Because in other words, if the government gets the resources from the CBI program, it can create jobs, it can create serious transformation of the economy of the country, which is already happening, Mr. Speaker. In other words, people will be happier, men, people will be making a better, having a better life, and they don't want that. They want a, a destroyed country because that's the only condition they perceive that will give them an opportunity for power. So they don't mind getting a baked country to manage. It's all about power for myself. The people does not matter. But this government, Mr. Speaker, believes the people is the fundamental basis that we all are here, Mr. Speaker. Not about ourselves. So we are very happy. And therefore, the, the decision, the recommendations, Mr. Speaker, here is necessary, as I said, to ensure that our program remains very competitive. And right now, Mr. Speaker, it is yielding quite a bit of resources to the transformation of this country, the economy. And I, I want to make the point. While it's doing well, and so far the resources that are obtained from the program, half of the year have surpassed the resources we have raised for the other two years of the program. But I want to make it clear, Mr. Speaker, and that's important. There's a perception that every time we have, we have done well financially, that the money should be going in one place. We have the fiscal space. But, Mr. Speaker, the demands on the resources of this country are pretty diverse. In fact, under the fiscal, under the structural adjustment program, and under the agreements we've signed with the bondholders and the people we owe money to, we have agreed to use portion of the citizenship results finances to pay down on the debt we owe people. In other words, we are committed in law to meet the obligation to the persons that we owe regionally and internationally. In addition, Mr. Speaker, we are owe almost $70 million. In unpaid claims, historically, governments owe that to court decisions and people whose sub governments taking people's lands and assets over the years, way back in the 60s and 70s and 80s, when they were acquiring left, right, and center for everything for government. They have service, service providers that we owe money to. And these monies are supposed, if from the CBI program, are supposed to be used to meet those obligations. We have not done that yet. So when some of us say we have the fiscal space, we know we have the fiscal space, so we should get more money and more money and more money. 
But the only people that can't get a cent more are those people sitting around the table, Mr. Speaker. Just let them get one cent more. And you hear noise. All hell break loose. But Mr. Speaker, we recognize that what, that's what we're here for. So as long as we meet our fundamental responsibility to the country, as long as we're able to invest in education and healthcare and the other stuff, and that these monies from the CBI program, so far over 24 million US dollars already this year, is still a drop in the bucket compared to what we owe and the responsibilities that we have to meet. So, Mr. Speaker, I support wholeheartedly the second reading of this important bill. Honorable members, the question is of the bill entitled Grenada Citizen by Investment Amendment Number 2 Bill 2017 be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. 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 Of the contrary opinion say nay. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. A bill for an act shortly entitled Grenada Citizenship by Investment Amendment Bill Number 2 Bill 2017. Honorable Representative for St. David. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move that the House resolves itself into a committee of the whole House to consider the bill clause by clause. Honorable Members, the question is that this Honorable House resolve itself into a committee of the whole House to consider the bill clause by clause. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Of the contrary opinion say nay. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Honorable members, this house now stands in committee. Clause 2, amendment of section 2 of principal act. Honorable members, the question is that clause 2, amendment of section 2 of principal act forms part of the bill. Those who are of that opinion say aye. Aye. Of the contrary opinion say nay. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clause 3. Insertion of new section 5A in the principal act. Honorable members, the question is that insertion, that clause 3, insertion of new section 5A in principal act forms part of the bill. Those who have that opinion say aye. aye. Of the contrary opinion say nay. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clause 4, amendment of section 8 of principal act. Honorable members, the question is that clause 4, amendment of section 8 of principal act forms part of the bill. Those who have that opinion say aye. aye. Of the contrary opinion say nay. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clause 1, short title. Honorable members, the question is that clause 1, short title forms part of the bill. Those of that opinion say aye. Of the contrary opinion say nay. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Honorable Representative for St. David. Mr. Chairman, I beg to move that the House resumes and the Chairman of Committee report progress on the bill. Honorable Members, the question is that this Honorable House resumes and the Chairman of Committee reports progress on the bill. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Of the contrary opinion, say nay. I think the eyes have it. The eyes have it. Honorable members, this house now resumes. I have to report that the bill was considered by a committee of the whole house and passed without amendment. Honorable Representative for St. David. I beg to move that the Chairman's report be adopted. Honorable Members, the question is that this Chairman's report be adopted. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Of the contrary opinion say nay. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it.
Honorable Representative for St. David. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move the third reading of the bill. Honorable Members, the question proposed is that the bill be read a third time. Honorable Members, the question is that the bill be read a third time and passed. Those who have that opinion say aye. aye. Of the contrary opinion say nay. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. A bill for an act shortly entitled Grenada Citizenship by Investment Amendment Number 2, Bill 2017. Leader of Government Business. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I beg to introduce for first reading the bill for an act shortly entitled Proceeds of Crime Amendment Bill 2017. An act to amend the Proceeds of Crime Act Number 6 of 2012, shortly entitled Proceeds of Crime Amendment Bill 2017. Leader of Government Business. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move that the relevant standing orders of the House be suspended in order to take the bill through all stages at this sitting. Honorable <coughs> Members, the question is that the re relevant standing orders of the House be suspended to enable the bill to be taken through all the stages at this sitting. Those who have that opinion say aye. 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 Of the contrary opinion say nay. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Leader of Government Business. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move the second reading of the bill. Honorable Members, the question proposed is that the bill be read a second time. Leader of Government Business. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I wish to remind this Honorable House that since, in particular, 9-11 and thereafter, a spate of bills have been passed throughout the world, particularly in the developing countries. We have the proceeds of crime, we have anti-money laundering, etc., etc. Mr. Speaker, those may have been trusted upon us in the sense by the developed countries with one aim to stop financing terrorism, to stop anti-money laundering. But the final objective is the terrorism. Because it's felt that they, we launder the money uh, or whoever is doing so with the intent of financing groups that stabilize peace throughout the world. In this context, Mr. Speaker, the Proceeds of Crime Bill ensures that every country locally has an institution that will look at how monies pass through various institutions, how it changes hands. And this is why, Mr. Speaker, we have complaints from many people that when they go into a bank, they ask them unnecessary questions, or questions about their private matters and issues. And when you tell them, and the bank is telling them this is enshrined in law, so they come back to the representative and say, what do you want to know all about our private citizens, Mr. Speaker? But many of those conditions, as I have said, have been imposed. Some work, some have the good intention, others people are annoyed with it, Mr. Speaker. It is in this context that the commission in Grenada and with respect to the OECS now and the commissions in the other country, the AML, anti-money laundering and anti-terrorism uh, commissions, they report to an international body to ensure that we have all these things in place. With respect to this, while we are reporting to these bodies, the international body has indicated some concerns and more so with the recent development in the US where they're trying to say, not trying to, but where they're indicating, if you do not put your house in order, then you will not have a corresponding bank for US transaction. And we know all the banks here, we paid to the US. And if you want to send monies abroad, 
It must go to a corresponding bank in New York, in Washington, wherever the case may be, so that you can send that money elsewhere. Businesses will come to a standstill in the OECS in particular, Mr. Speaker, if we do not have corresponding banks. And we hear the term be risking being used, so we want to remove the risk of this happening to us. One of the conditions that has been proposed by the Monetary Council of the ECCB when they met is to put the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank in charge. Yes, our countries do have local commissions made by the police, FIU, uh, Ministry of Finance, etc. You have this commission reporting, the Attorney General, etc. But when the council met, and when that uh, threat of not being able to get corresponding banks in the US really showed its ugly head, the commission says, well, we want somebody to coordinate it. So we want the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank to be on top of all these commissions so that we would not fall victim to this, Mr. Speaker. So this bill seeks to give the effect to the decision of the Monetary Council. In its drive towards the risking, as I mentioned, the, the bank encourages member governments to approve the ECCB's assumption of the full responsibility for the AML, the anti-money laundering, and CFT counterfinancing of terrorism regulations of all institutions under the Banking Act. Um, I stand corrected here, but there are some institutions in Grenada that are not under the Banking Act, but indirectly they are under Garfin, and Garfin is part of the local commission. So indirectly, the bank does, the ECCB does have control of it, Mr. Speaker. And if we look at the amendments, Section 2 is amended by inserting in our, our alphabetical order the following definitions. Anti-money laundering and terrorism financial legislation, and they tell you that this means the definition holds as they are defined in the principal act. And the central bank, the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank. There's nothing new here, Mr. Speaker. But Section 32 of the Principal Act is amended by inserting after commission and the central bank. So we're now saying that anti-money laundering and counter-terrorism activities will be supervised both by the commission and by this super body, the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank, Mr. Speaker. After the word, in the other subsections, the same, after commission, you keep adding and the central bank. So now both persons will have jurisdiction, both institutions will have jurisdiction, Mr. Speaker. Section 63 of the Principal Act is amended by providing the, the following, Mr. Speaker. In subsection one, by inserting after the word enactment, except a licensed financial institution regulated by the central bank under the Banking Act. So you'll come under significant uh, difficulty to do banking transaction and monetary transaction if you're not supervised by the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank. Mr. Speaker. Insertion of a new section 63A in the Principal Act. The Principal Act is amended by inserting after six, section 63 the following new section, regulator of licensed financial institutions. The Central Bank is established as the anti-money laundering and combating terrorist financial regulator of all licensed financial institutions. So this is giving effect to what the council says. So not only the commission that you have to deal with, you know, deal with the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank, Mr. Speaker. And it, it is, will create and promote training requirements for licensed financial institution. So now it's a bank responsibility to train the staff of all the banks in the country, not only this country, but member states of the OECS to do this. So perhaps they'll be even asking more questions, taking more data to ensure that your transaction has nothing to do with counter, uh, with um, terrorist financing or with money laundering. The ECCB could now inspect, conduct inspection of any licensed financial institution whenever in its judgment an inspection is necessary or expedient to determine compliance. So they will pounce on the bank, 
So the bank will ask you a more numerous questions when you enter them, Mr. Speaker. They will send to the unit any information derived from an inspection, so they must inform the bank, inform the commission here, and inform the ministry. If they pick up that something may happen, there may be a transaction that you know, requires your attention that could be possibly anti-money laundering or terrorism for financing. They will maintain statistics, Mr. Speaker, and the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank will undertake any measure necessary to give effect to the anti-money laundering legislation. So the bank, in its own right, could demand of the institutions under the supervision that they put into place certain things, that they get certain information, et cetera, et cetera, Mr. Speaker. So in this context, while some of it people may look at being intrusive, it is a requirement. Let us look at the problems that we could face if we don't do that, if we don't want to provide the answers, if we feel that they're prying into our private business. Well, we just don't have a corresponding bank. So when you move into any of the banks in Grenada and you want to send any, anything abroad, and that's how the businesses pay for their imports, then they will not be able to import. It has serious consequences, Mr. Speaker. So yes, we are here being pried into. That's how we feel. But let us look at the consequences. And it is best that the banks will sort of minimize. It is their customer, so they'll minimize unnecessary prime. But whatever is necessary, we have to give them the full support to do it because the consequence, Mr. Speaker, will be too devastating. As a such, Mr. Speaker, I recommend this amendment for a second reading. Honorable Representative for St. David. Mr. Speaker, I rise to give my full support to this bill as well articulated by the presenter. We have had a number of legislation passed, anti-money laundering legislation. What this one is seeking is to say that the ECCB will be able to regulate financial institutions. So you have your local commission, but the, the ECCB will direct have direct control over these financial institutions in terms of monitoring and reporting their activities. And that is extremely critical, and I want to pick up on the point that was last made by the presenter with, res with regard to de-risking. And just to add something there, why, why is it called de-risking? So you have a bank in the US uh, that you have to do the transaction through. The United States government introduced a number of regulations and laws that you have to follow. The banks are saying this amount of paperwork that we have to do now to report, we can take on all this, this small transaction. The risk involved in that is too much for us, so we do not want to do business. So they're saying no. they came up with the term that they must de-risk us, so we are risk. Too much paperwork, too much reporting, that everything that comes into the bank has to be transparent. One bank reported they have to hire hundreds of people in a department to track all these uh, transactions, you know. Because, as you know, the USA, some of this money are going to terrorist activities. So you have to be tracked. And I say, well, this onerous regulation there, hiring all these people to monitor these transactions, we can't take on it. So we have to put in place all these regulations that are required in order for us to stay in business to be transparent. But it goes beyond just banks. You know, Mr. Mr. Speaker, this de-risking also affect money transfer agencies, you know, Western Union and MoneyGram and so on, you know, because they are involved in foreign exchange transactions. So when somebody sends you money to, to, to Grenada, that too is involved. So you see, not only the goods and services that we must pay for in US currency that we have to go through the bank and do it, but the amount of remittances, as you, and you know, in the Caribbean, and including Grenada, remittances is, a, is big. Not only for the carnival season, and people come here and they'll bring, people are constantly sending remittances to Grenada and that contributes to our foreign exchange. So that can have a big impact. 
And therefore, we must put these things in place and need law and have our local commission and the central bank clearly monitoring it to satisfy the condition because the effect you're going to have, the impact of that is so huge that, Mr. Speaker, this is extremely critical to put in place for our country. And therefore, I give my full support to this bill. Honorable Representative for St. George Northwest. Yeah, Mr. Mr. Speaker, I just stand to, of course, give my full support to the second reading of this Proceeds of Crime Amendment Bill. Mr. Speaker, just to, to add um, to what the member of the Southeast, St. George, has pointed out, this bill is an initiative of the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank, of course, which, of course, is responsible for all financial transactions within the OECS. Um, and, of course, the Monetary Council of the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank, which Grenada is a member, as, and, of course, as Minister of Finance, I'm Grenada's representative in the Monetary Council. Um, and uh, some time ago, initiated this regional bill to harmonize how we approach the whole question of proceeds of crime. And therefore, some of the countries have already passed this. So this is not just a Grenada initiative or Grenada bill by itself. It's an attempt to harmonize the whole proceeds of crime um, in, in the region. And it is, it is understood, Mr. Speaker, it will enhance the image of the region because what they've noticed is the initiative taken by some countries are varied in many respects. Some countries' laws are much stronger than others. And therefore, the feeling is if one country in the monitoring council has major financial difficulties with proceeds of crime, it will affect all of us. <laughs> In fact, the general feeling and what we know, if there is any serious incident of terrorism in the region or if someone has been able to use one of our country's financial system for terrorism-related activities, <laughs> it does not matter which country is involved. What you hear is the OECS is a problem area. So all of us is treated with this one brush. <laughs> so if we are going to be treated as such, then we all must take stock and harmonize our approach. And many of these initiative, financial in, um, initiatives that we are taking, that we are dealing with at this point, because the world is watching us. As the member of Southeast pointed out, one of the critical areas of concern right now is, yes, the all concern about financial crimes in general, but the most major concern right now is the terrorism-related activities with financial criminal activities. So the necessity for supporting this is quite sunk, Mr. Speaker, and therefore I give my full support as a member of the Monetary Council and someone who strongly supported this initiative as Grenada has consistently done with his regional initiative, I give my full support to the second reading of this bill. Honorable members, the question is that the bill proceeds of crime amendment bill 
2017 be read a second time. Those who have that opinion say aye. 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 Of the contrary opinion say nay. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. A bill for an act shortly entitled Proceeds of Crime Amendment Bill 2017. Leader of Government Business. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I beg to move that the House resolves itself into a committee of the whole House to consider the bill clause by clause. The question is, honorable members, that this House resolve itself into a committee of the whole House to consider the bill clause by clause. Those who have that opinion say aye. aye. Of the contrary opinion say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Honourable members, this House House stands in committee. <laughs> Clause 2, Amendment of Section 2 of Principal Act. Honourable members, the question is that Clause 2 forms part of the bill. Those who have that opinion say aye. aye. Of the contrary opinion say nay. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clause 3, amendment of section 32 of Principal Act. And I remember the question is that clause 3 forms part of the bill. Those who have that opinion say aye. aye. Of the contrary opinion say nay. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clause 4, amendment of section 63 of Principal Act. And I remember the question is that Clause 4 forms part of the bill. Those who have that opinion say aye. aye. Of the contrary opinion say nay. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clause 5, amendment of Section 63A of Principal Act. And I remember the question is that Clause 5 forms part of the bill. Those who have that opinion say aye. aye. Of the contrary opinion say nay. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clause 1, short title. And I remember the question is that Clause 1, short title, forms part of the bill. Those who have that opinion say aye. aye. Of the contrary opinion say nay. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Leader of Government Business. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I beg to move that the House resumes and the Chairman of the Committee reports progress on the bill. And I remember the question is that this Honorable House resumes and the Chairman of Committee reports progress on the bill. Those who have that opinion say aye. aye. Of the contrary opinion say nay. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Honorable members, this House now resumes. I have to report that the bill was considered by a committee of the whole House and passed without amendment. Leader of Government Business. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move that the Chairman's report be adopted. Honorable members, the question is that the Chairman's report be adopted. Those who have that opinion say aye. aye. Of the contrary opinion say nay. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Leader of Government Business. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, I beg to move the third reading of the bill. Honorable members, the question proposed is that the bill be read a third time. And I remember the question is that the bill be read a third time and passed. Those who have that opinion say aye. aye. Of the contrary opinion say nay. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. A bill for an act shortly entitled Proceeds of Crime Amendment Bill 2017. Representative for St. David. Mr. Speaker, I beg you introduce for first reading a bill for an act shortly entitled Cooperative Society's Amendment Bill 2017. An act to amend the Cooperative Societies Act Cap 66A, shortly entitled Cooperative Society Amendment Bill 2017. Honorable Representative for St. David. 
Mr. Speaker, I beg to move that the relevant standing orders of the House be suspended to enable the bill to be taken through all the stages at this city. Honorable Members, the question is that the relevant standing orders of the House be suspended to enable the bill to be taken through all its stages at the, this sitting. Those who have that opinion say aye. aye. Of the contrary opinion say nay. I think the ayes have it, the ayes have it. Honorable Representative for St. David. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move the second reading of the bill. Mr. Speaker, cooperative societies have been around for a long time. I sure you recall the days when they used to be called friendly societies. So you see, most of them closed down because they were so friendly. So you have the, these cooperative societies. So, Mr. Speaker, this year is, we have 22 amendments that have been made because now you have the cooperative societies now the predominantly credit unions. And so you think to amend the Cooperative Society Act to bring it in line with the way that credit unions now operate. And that's why you see we are, uh, this bill here contains 22, uh, 22 amendments. I will not go through each one by one because that will take us the rest of the day. But I want to highlight some key, just to highlight some key, um, to key some key areas. The Act revised the definition what you want, uh, associate capital base, equity shares, institutional capital, qualifying shares, and inserting the definition of spouse, single man, and single woman. These are some key changes that you may think look minor, but for example, if you take uh, equity shares, that was never there before. Now, if you join the, the credit union, the, it's compulsory that you buy equity share now in the, in the credit union. That is non withdrawable Then you have qualifying shares. So to join the credit union, they will say, well, you have to purchase certain shares to qualify. And also, the speaker, the the definition of spouse. There are some minor changes, as I said, where you change corporate to cooperative, and you have some typographical errors that I, I wouldn't highlight. Uh, most of these, but as I said, I will, where the, the major um, change or that been recommended, I will um, on, uh, highlight. So, clause 15, 6 to amend section 120, subsection 2, by qualifying the reserves as statutory reserves, you know, it's a thing every institution must have uh, statutory reserves. And by repealing and replacing subsection 3 to set the limits for investments aimed at protecting the capital base with power of variation of the limits line with the registrar. So the registrar of cooperatives will have that. So you must have uh, statutory reserves and they will set limit and the amount that will be invested to be able to protect the capital base of the credit union. Subsection 4 and 5 would be amended by substituting inst institutional capital for statutory reserves. And we have 7% for 10% and 30% for 20%. All these are, are important changes to protect the assets, Mr. Speaker, of the credit union. A word the word, wife appears, it shall be spouses. Clause 21 seeks to amend section 200 in the principal act, subsection 1, with the word this act, subsection 2, by substituting the phrase a liquidity reserve with liquidity form and by replacing subsection 3 and 4 as they have been relocated to section 125 of the previous in the, in the major act. And by deleting the reference to pearls in Clause to section 201 2, because PERLS means the international prudential and operating standards and monitoring system as produced and approved by the World Council of Credit Unions in respect of protection, asset quality, rates of return, and costs 
liquidity, and sign of good. That's a sta prudential standard that's used to judge performance of credit union. But where it is there in the, in the old act, it does not apply in, in, this, in, in this sense, where, where it appears, and therefore a change is recommended there. So, Mr. Speaker, the, the credit unions as an institution in Grenada, with thousands of members offering services to credit union, it is important that we update the legislation to reflect the role as a major financial institution in the country. And therefore, these amendments are seeking to do just that, to strengthen the institutional framework for credit unions and other related matters so that they can be updated. So, as I said, it's 22 amendments, most of which, some of which are typographical errors and so on, that um, I would not um, repeat, but to say that I think that this bill comes at an extremely important time. And all that is to strengthen the financial system and is to ensure that the people's finances are protected. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honorable Representative for St. Andrew Northwest. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I stand to support the Cooperative Society Amendment Bill. Um, this bill, Mr. Speaker, really seeks to strengthen the whole credit union. And many of us here know that the credit union is really a non-profit organization. It's really workers and, and ordinary people saving and borrowing among themselves. Uh, and therefore, anything that will assist in strengthening that institution, I will support. And therefore, I, I really want to support that recommend those recommendations made by Gaffin in consultation with the credit, union, credit unions of Grenada. Um, the credit union really, we get um, easier loans and even the poor man can save there and get a higher interest. And therefore, Mr. Speaker, I will support those amendments, that the 22 amendments. I thank you. Thank you, Honorable Representative for St. Andrew Northwest. Honorable Representative for St. Andrew Southeast. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I just want to quickly add that I fully support the amendments uh, made this morning, proposed this morning, and to say that anything that is done in keeping with strengthening and bettering and making um, good uh, has to be supported, and especially the fact that if you look at what has happened over the history of our country as it relates to credit union and other small financial institutions and some of the lessons we've learned, we ought to know that in this changing economic and financial environment that we have to continuously be doing all that we can to strengthen systems and to put systems in place for more monitoring of those institutions, organizations, and existing systems that we may have. And so in, in light of that, I fully support. Um, Mr. Speaker, especially as it relates to monitoring the management and the systems in place for the handling of, 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 of um, the finances of ordinary people, and I speak ordinary, not that other people <laughs> do not invest and, and probably um, put their resources there. But if we go back to what has happened, for example, with um, Cap Bank, and speaking in a more general context now, and when we look at how ordinary people have been affected um, because of the lack of systems and the lack of monitoring and so on um, that, 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 that we did not have, we really do not want to end up in some of those situations again. And I'm really happy to see Gaffin and the government um, departments and so on responsible are putting more and more measures in place to monitor and to guide and to really ensure that um, our financial systems are strengthened. Um, looking at section, and I just want to point out a, a basic example, which is um, 
amendment to section 121 and that has to do um, with the the whole issue of how you can you can learn for example um, as it relates to directors and persons who have key positions um, within those organizations and that they shouldn't be treated um, different to the ordinary persons who lend. And I think those kind of measures are so very important because sometimes people can get carried away because of their positions and so on in organizations. And I just want to make that particular point that anything done in that context to strengthen the financial systems that exist um, must be applauded and must be supported. And I just want to give my fullest support um, to all of the amendments that are proposed this morning. Thank you, Honorable Rep Representative for St. Andrew Southeast. I, let me just say, I remember the friendly society, man. When you had to travel long distances every fortnight to go and pay the society for your mother, grandmother, and uncle, and so on. And how you get your benefits, you send anybody to the doctor, give your name. And in any case, what the doctor would give is either quinine or alcopa. Nobody takes it and you get a little two shilling and so on, or a shilling and sixpence from the friendly society. So the people knew how to get this. So I wish we would have that documented so our, our children can probably put this in a big movie one day, the friendly society. And I have a representative for St. David. I beg to comment the bill for, two, for a second reading. And I remember the question is that the bill be read a second time. Those who have that opinion say aye. Of the contrary opinion say nay. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. A bill for an act shortly entitled Cooperative Society's Amendment Bill 2017. Honorable Representative for St. David. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move that the House resolve itself with the Committee of the Whole House to consider the bill clause by clause. Honorable Members, the question is that this Honorable House resolve itself into a Committee of the Whole House to consider the bill clause by clause. Those who have that opinion say aye. Mm. Of the contrary opinion say nay. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Honorable members, this house now stands in committee. Clause 2, amendment of section 2 of principal act. Honorable members, the question is that clause 2 forms part of the bill. Those who have that opinion say aye. Of the contrary opinion say nay. I think the ayes have it, the ayes have it. Clause 3, amendment of section 7 of Principal Act. And I remember the question is that clause 3 forms part of the bill. Those who have that opinion say aye. Of the contrary opinion say nay. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clause 4, amendment of section 8 of Principal Act. And I remember the question is that clause 4 forms part of the bill. Those who have that opinion say aye. Of the contrary opinion say nay. I think the ayes have it, the ayes have it. Clause 5, amendment of section 13 of Principal Act. And I remember the question is that clause 5 forms part of the bill. Those who have that opinion say aye. Of the contrary opinion say nay. I think the ayes have it, the ayes have it. Clause 6, amendment of section 16 of Principal Act. And I remember the question is that clause 6 forms part of the bill. Those who have that opinion say aye. Of the contrary opinion say nay. I think the ayes have it, the ayes have it. Clause 7, amendment of section 29 of Principal Act. And I remember the question is that clause 7 forms part of the bill. Those who have that opinion say aye. Of the contrary opinion say nay. I think the ayes have it, the ayes have it.
Clause 8, amendment of section 31 of Principal Act. Honorable members, the question is that Clause 8 forms part of the bill. Those who have that opinion say aye. The contrary opinion say nay. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clause 9, amendment of section 46 of Principal Act. Honorable members, the question is that Clause 9 forms part of the bill. Those who have that opinion say aye. Of the contrary opinion say nay. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clause 10, amendment of section 83 of Principal Act. And I remember the question is that Clause 10 forms part of the bill. Those who have that opinion say aye. Of the contrary opinion say nay. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clause 11, amendment of section 96 of Principal Act. And I remember the question is that Clause 11 forms part of the bill. Those who have that opinion say aye. Of the contrary opinion say nay. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clause 12, amendment of section 97 of Principal Act. And I remember the question is that Clause 12 forms part of the bill. Those who have that opinion say aye. Of the contrary opinion say nay. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clause 13, amendment of section 102 of Principal Act. And I remember the question is that Clause 13 forms part of the bill. Those who have that opinion say aye. Of the contrary opinion say nay. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clause 14, amendment of section 117 of Principal Act. And I remember the question is that Clause 14 forms part of the bill. Those who have that opinion say aye. Of the contrary opinion say nay. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clause 15, amendment of section 120 of Principal Act. And I remember the question is that Clause 15 forms part of the bill. Those who have that opinion say aye. Of the contrary opinion say nay. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clause 16, amendment of section 121 of Principal Act. And I remember the question is that Clause 16 forms part of the bill. Those who have that opinion say aye. Of the contrary opinion say nay. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clause 17, amendment of section 125 of Principal Act. And I remember the question is that Clause 17 forms part of the bill. Those who have that opinion say aye. Of the contrary opinion say nay. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clause 18, amendment of 127 of Principal Act. And I remember the question is that Clause 18 forms part of the bill. Those who have that opinion say aye. Of the contrary opinion, say nay. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clause 19, amendment of section 129 of Principal Act. And I remember the question is that Clause 19 forms part of the bill. Those who have that opinion, say aye. Of the contrary opinion, say nay. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clause 20, amendment. Amendment of section 131 of Principal Act. And I remember the question is that Clause 20 forms part of the bill. Those who have that opinion say aye. Of the contrary opinion say nay. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clause 21, Amendment of section 200 of Principal Act. And I remember the question is that Clause 21 forms part of the bill. Those who have that opinion say aye. Of the contrary opinion say nay. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clause 22, amendment of section 201 of Principal Act. And I remember the question is that clause 22 forms part of the bill. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary opinion say nay. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clause 1, short title. And I remember the question is that clause 1, short title, forms part of the bill. Those of that opinion say aye. Of the contrary opinion, say nay. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Honorable Representative for St. David. Mr. Chairman, I beg to move that the House resumes and the Chairman of Committee reports progress on the bill. Honorable Member, the question is that this Honorable House resumes and the Chairman of Committee reports progress on the bill. Those who have that opinion, say aye. Of the contrary opinion, say nay. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it.
Honorable members, this Honorable House now resumes. I have to report I have to report that the bill was considered by a committee of the whole House and passed without amendments. Honorable Representative for St. David. I beg to move that the Chairman's report be adopted. Honorable Members, the question is that this Chairman's report be adopted. Those who have that opinion say aye. Of the contrary opinion say nay. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Honorable Representative for St. David. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move the third reading of the bill. Honorable Members, the question proposed is that the bill be read a third time. Honorable Members, the question is that the bill be read a third time and passed. Those who have that opinion say aye. aye. Of the contrary opinion say nay. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. A bill for an act shortly entitled Cooperative Societies Amendment Bill 2017. Leader of Government Business. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, in requesting your leave to withdraw the next bill on the order people, representation of the people amendment bill 2017, it is imperative that I inform this honorable house that this bill has been approved by the cabinet many moons ago. As you are aware, the procedure is it comes to cabinet, gets approval, that's government bill, private bill can go through a different um, process. And we have been awaiting the consent from parties, in particular the National Democratic Congress. This bill emanated from the supervisor of elections, and he has articulated very clearly the positives in giving him and explaining and doing things that will make the election day machinery more efficient, that will make registration more efficient, that will remove a lot of um, doubts and problems in mind. So we have agreed that until the main opposition party at least, or at most, give the consent to everything and in writing that we will not proceed with the bill. We have been advised by the supervisor of elections that the National Democratic Con Congress in his meeting with them has indicated that they have no problems whatsoever with what is here. However, they have not signed the document indicating so. It therefore behoves us at this point in time to withdraw the bill until we have the main opposition party's consent and in this regard, Mr. Speaker, I am proposing and requesting your leave to withdraw this bill and so that it can return whenever the supervisor of elections advise that he has the consent of the or he has, he has indicated that he has the agreements, but until we get this in writing, then we will return with this bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Leader of Government Business. Your request. An explanation for the removal of this bill on the this time is granted. So honorable members, the bill representation of the People's Amendment Bill 2017 would not be addressed today. Leader of Government Business. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Therefore, with your leave, we'll proceed to the next bill on the order paper. And I want to introduce for first reading the bill for an act shortly entitled Road Traffic Amendment Bill 2017. An act to amend the Road Traffic Act, Cap 289A, shortly entitled Road Traffic Amendment Bill 2017. Leader of Government Business. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
I beg to move that the relevant standing orders of the House be suspended in order to facilitate the bill going through all stages at the sitting. Honorable members, the question is that the relevant standing orders of the House be suspended to enable the bill to be taken through all the stages at the sitting. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Of the contrary opinion say nay. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Leader of Government Business. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move the second reading of the bill. Honorable members, the question proposed is that the bill, Road Traffic Amendment Bill 2017, be read a second time. Leader of Government Business. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the amendment to this, to this particular bill stems from discussions with the, the police in particular. We have a lot to do with road traffic, with the Ministry of Health, and other stakeholders, Mr. Speaker, the public in general. We note that we have had a series of accidents over the last few years. And these can be attributed to instances of driving under the influence, driving with handheld devices in our hands, performing other activities, and in particular, Mr. Speaker, we also want to enhance the ability of the police to carry out the work for an unobstructed traffic flow throughout the nations, Mr. Speaker. In this context, this bill seeks to amend the Road Traffic Act to address four primary issues. The first, the execution of oral alcohol tests by members of the Royal Grenada Police Force. We know of this in the other countries, in other jurisdictions, in the developed countries, and right here within our own sub-region, Mr. Speaker. The second, Objective, the execution of drug tests are through the members of the Royal Grenada Police Force. That is, if you refer to other types of, of, of drugs that could have negative effects, that could impair our judgments. So alcohol by itself, other type of drugs, Mr. Speaker. It's the third, the use of mobile devices by drivers while driving or in control of a motor vehicle. So this am amendment will address this, Mr. Speaker. And four, the use of immob immobilizing devices and the tow trucks by members of the Royal Grenada Police Force. So these are the four objectives, the four missions that this big bill seeks, Mr. Speaker, to address. With the execution, Mr. Speaker, And we would start as following along as the amendment. We will go first to the last one mentioned, immobilizing vehicles, Mr. Speaker. And this will give the police the authority to put some immobilizing instrument device on your vehicle. Mainly, it's a clamp on the wheel. If you're obstructing traffic, if you're parked in the wrong place, and this is not strange to us, it may not be happening here, but we're well aware that in other countries you cannot, as we quote unquote, bad park and uh, have the police only be able to tow you off. No, they can do it, but we're not giving them the authority to also put a clamp on the wheel. The law gives the minister the authority through regulations to see what sort of device you can use. It is pointing here particular to some mechanical device, Mr. Speaker. But we know that you have electrical devices. And you can see it. It can be shot from a helicopter straight into your car. All goes your computer system. Can't move. But for here, in this particular one, we're talking about a mechanical device, Mr. Speaker. So, Section 3, insertion of Section 13, the, the Principal Act, power to fit immobilizing device. And it says, 
any vehicle parked or left on the road or at a place in such a manner as to cause danger or obstruction to other traffic on the road contrary to this act. If it's parked or left on the road or at a place in contravention of another provision of this act, a police officer or a person authorized by a police officer may place the vehicle under the control of the police force by fitting and immobilizing device onto the vehicle. The owner of the vehicle, Mr. Speaker, under the control of the police by virtue of Section 1 may recover the vehicle if a fee of $125 and $25 for each day, a part thereof during which the immobilizing device has been fitted onto the vehicle is paid to the officer in charge or to the nearest police station. The issue, therefore, will become with the Ministry of Finance, etc., to set up the, the system where you go and pay. But you don't want to have to go to the church, Mr. Speaker, when it happened on a Saturday morning, and wait until Monday. So I think the person or the owner of the vehicle is being facilitated because you come and you pay your fine and you leave. As is always under natural justice, you could decide I'm not paying any fine and etc. I'm going to the court. As if you get a ticket, you could you have recourse to the court. But this is making it something like a ticket offense and you have an easy way out. And no person except the police officer or authorized, a person authorized by a police officer may remove or attempt to remove the device. So if it's there and you see it's locked, please don't touch it. Then you're making the matters worse. And if the motor vehicle remains under the control of the police for more than three months, the police can apply to the court to dispose of this vehicle. Other laws will kick into place. Maybe they have to pay you for the vehicle and take the, the cost of the time, etc., out of it. But I think other laws will determine how they should dispose of the vehicle. And a person who contravenes this subjection commits an offense and is liable on summary conviction to a fine of $5,000, Mr. Speaker. This, and I know some of those coming after me will make further contribution in this particular area drugs and alcoholic liquor, they're defined differently. So you have other drugs and you have alcohol if you want to refer it in written quote and quote a drug. So the law, the proposal is to amend the law by including this section. Without prejudice to the generality of subsection one, a person who has consumed alcohol in such a quantity that the proportion thereof in his or her breath of blood exceeds the prescribed limit is unfit to drive a vehicle. So now this is approved. Once you have above that, those prescribed limits, you should not, and you will be going against the law to drive a vehicle. In the case of breath, 35 micrograms of alcohol in 100 milliliters of breath, etc., and of course, I'll leave the rest of what should be the blood to, for the contribution from the Minister for Health. We'll go further in explaining this. And also our Minister for Tourism, who is a practitioner, so we could get further explanation of what these numbers mean from these persons, Mr. Speaker. The next, the testing for alcohol. So where a member of the police force has reasonable cause to suspect and we see it in the movies, you see it when you visit abroad, you might see the car wobbling, you might come out of the car and you see the person drifting. So you must have reasonable grounds to suspect. And that person has been driving or attempting to drive or has been in charge of a motor vehicle on a road and has committed an offense against the act, they can demand that you take a breathalyzer. That is the breath test, Mr. Speaker. Where an accident occurs involving a motor vehicle on a road and a member of the police force on arriving at the place of the accident has reasonable cause to believe that at the time of the accident, any person involved in the accident was under the influence of alcohol, the member may require the person to provide a specimen for a breath or blood test. Police now has had this power, Mr. Speaker. No requirement may be made by virtue of paragraph B or C in subject, unless it is made as soon as reasonably practicable 
after the occurrence of the accident. In other words, if the accident occurred five, six hours ago, you cannot be coming on the scene and making such a demand. So it must be within the close proximity, respect the time, and of course the Ministry of Health and the police force will be working at, you know, at times that should be one hour, half an hour, etc. In the case of a person who is at a hospital as a patient, unless the medical practitioner is in charge of his or her case. So even if the, the person was driving under the influence, they got damaged in the accident, and they know on the medical practitioners, you have to get the consent. Even if the police wants to do it, then it's now out of the police's hand, and it, it is under the purview of the medical persons at the hospital or at the medical station. So you cannot come demanding things if the person will die by, you know, the test being done, etc. It will be up to the medical practitioner. A person who without reasonably excused refuses to provide a specimen that is either of your breath or your blood, or, or willfully does anything to alter the concentration of alcohol in his or her breath or blood between the time of the event and the time when he or she undergoes that test, commits an offense. Again, the health person may tell you how you could do that. Perhaps if immediately after the accident there is a certain chemical that's being sold and you consume it and it changes the concentration, you will be violating the law, Mr. Speaker, because you're willfully trying to mislead the result or to mislead the person doing the result. Such a person on first conviction, a fine of $5,000 and imprisonment for 12 months. In the case of a second or subsequent conviction, to a fine of $10,000 or to imprisonment for two years, Mr. Speaker. It will be a defense, note Mr. Speaker, to a prosecution for an officer and for an offense under subsection 4 if the accused satisfies the court that he or she was unable on medical grounds at the time required to do so to undergo the breath of blood test. So on medical grounds, you should not be doing it. That's a defense. Again, the health practitioners will see on what occasions or what constitutes such a defense. It says that the police may, without prejudice to subsection, uh, subsection 62, subsection 4, arrest a person if a person is found to have in his a, a blood proportion of alcohol exceeding the limit. But a person arrested under subsection 6 shall, while at the police station, be given an opportunity to provide a specimen for a breath a blood test. So it, the amendment looks at making it very easy for the person to do it, and even after you're arrested, so that the court would not be looking at your refusal to do something and apply the maximum penalty. If you relent thereafter while in the police station, yes, you may do it. Obviously, you have to look at a person staying in the police station for eight hours and then say, no, I'm ready to do it. You would have violated something else because the proximity in time would have gone. So I think the police who have already been studying this bill have a lot to do to ensure that it is properly administered. Control drugs that's other than alcohol. The same thing. A member of the police force has reasonable cause to suspect that person is driving or attempting to drive he, um, under the influence of a controlled drug. He has the same power. Arrest again. Demand that you take um, certain tests. What, again, is noted here is that if a person refuses to take it, you cannot compel it. The, the court will decide what um, you're doing with that particular person, Mr. Speaker. And only authorized persons to carry out the test. And it says, the subject to subsection 2, the purpose of section 62, B and C, a breath, urine, a blood test shall be carried out by a medical practitioner, laboratory technician registered under the Health Practitioners Act. So these are the persons. So you don't expect that the policeman will attempt to do so. No. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, I now to move into the section of the Principal Act to deal with 
handheld devices. And interpretation of section 77B to the interactive communication functions, sending or receiving oral or written messages. So that means you could be talking on the phone or you could be texting on the phone. Sending or receiving a facsimile. You know the smartphones now can do anything. Sending or receiving still a moving images. So somebody sends a, sends a picture to you of something that is happening down the road and you forget the driving and looking at the picture. All of this will be prohibited. Providing access to the internet. Don't try to get, in, get onto the internet through your smartphone when you're driving. And mobile device means a mobile telephone or any other device which performs an interactive communication functions by transmitting and receiving data. So you can have your small tablets, which you call a phablet, and you may say, I don't have a phone. So this covers this. Don't be doing this thing. Use. Again, we were looking and we we're gaining experience from the other jurisdiction. When you say use, you mean holding the mobile devo device to or near the air, whether or not engaged on a phone call. So you might not be doing anything with the phone. Do not occupy the hands there for driving. So don't hold the phone with it and you tell the policeman, well, I was not using it, even if you can prove you are not using it. Creating, sending, and looking at a text, do not watch the phone. Turning the mobile device on or off. If it rings, allow it to ring. Do not take the hands of the steering wheel and turn it off. The hands must be on the steering wheel. You have lives at risk when you do that. Operating any other function of the mobile device. And the act gives the minister the authority to make regulations to exempt a specified device from the definition of mobile phone and the categories of persons who will be exempted. People in an ambulance, the ambulance drivers and so forth going on may have to communicate to save the patient's life. The police service may have to communicate to avoid a terrorist incident lower down the way. So these persons and others will be exempted from time to time as the various categories uh, will be exempted. Yeah, they never said anymore. Okay. <laughs> the minister, right? the police. <laughs> <laughs> Prohibition, driving while holding, using, we mentioned this earlier. For the avoidance of doubt, nothing in subsection 1 authorizes a person to use a mobile device by pressing a key on the mobile device or any, or by otherwise manipulating the body or screen of the mobile device if the mobile device is not secured to a mountain affixed to the mobile vehicle. So we, we learn from those countries who have already put this in place, and you see there is a mountain vehicle and you put your phone on it. The point is, once you take your hands off, that is a problem. To operate the phone on the mount, that is a problem. We do have, in the later vehicles, it's on the steering wheel. So the phone rings, and you have your either earpiece, either through Bluetooth, that is non-connected, or connected through a wire, and the phone's ring, and you answer. The problem is, if you speak, everybody in the car will hear what you're saying. You may not wish to do that. But you could turn the phone off and you could say, I've received your message. I'll call you back on such and such a time. So all of these things is a speaker we want to put in place. Again, Mr. Speaker, we just want to look here for the, the definition of the minister. And um, to take quote, we have a lot of things to do with health. Should it be the minister for works dealing with health? We have a lot of things to do with um, the Ministry of for the Police. You know, should it be the, the Minister of Health dealing with the police? So um, uh, as my interpretation, and the, we'll get it from, from them, Mr. Speaker, is that the various ministers under the various jurisdictions will be handling the various issues, Mr. Speaker. Yes. So, Mr. Speaker, I commend this bill for your second reading. Mr. Speaker, I just want to stand because I have to leave it. 
I know many members would want to comment on, on this um, very important bill, and particularly on the second reading. Um, just to, for the member of Southeast in presenting the bill, did ex explain thoroughly many of the sections and initiatives that are being proposed to be passed in this important bill. But I just want to make, to strengthen the reason for this um, bill today, probably we should have had this a long time ago. Many countries in the region um, have in fact moved ahead of us in terms of ensuring that they want to protect their citizens. Mr. Speaker, as it relates to the whole question of mobile and the technology, I have seen in driving here many instances, even with the official prime minister's vehicle, vehicles almost crash into the prime minister's vehicle. But when you look, when you check carefully, <laughs> people are on the phone. So and as they catch themselves, you could see they moved away. It could easily have been an accident. Only because we don't have a lot of highways here, I think we are lucky. So we, we should not be um, playing with that luck for too long. Sometimes, Mr. Speaker, you see someone and they have two phones. <laughs> How they're steering the vehicle, I don't know. So which is make it double dangerous. So there's no doubt of the necessity to protect the same drivers and the public on this important initiative. But the one I want to give a practical example of how serious it is, there is that perception, and you hear it said, in fact, in fact only last week in a discussion with some friends, it was being said, when I drink, I drive better. <laughs> you hear that, Mr. Speaker, when I drink, I feel. What is happening? They feel they drive better. It's like everything else. Some people are afraid to, 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 take, to stand up and speak in a particular forum. They take two drinks, and they're ready to talk. They have to talk to the opposite sex. They're afraid to talk. <laughs> but when they drink, they turn man or woman. <laughs> but Mr. Speaker, I, I remember in the 80s, early 80s, there was this big move in the US about this imposing these laws on drivers to protect people. And this, they had a television program trying to demonstrate the necessity for this. So they had 10 drivers, and they all were interviewed, and they said, all said that they quite clear, whenever they drink, they are much better drivers. So they had this test where they put this, some sticks, and they had these drivers, they, they, they gave them beers, after the, the, initially, they passed through, no problem. Give them the first beer. Most of them passed through, fine. Maybe one did a little bouncing here and there. By the time they get the second beer, two, three drivers start bouncing. The same sticks that they passed through quite comfortably. By the time they drink the fourth beer, everyone, Mr. Speaker, Bunks down every single one of those, those sticks. It was very clear, the demonstration. And that was, people stood up because it was advertised that they were coming. And this was live broadcast, not something they make up and they decide who, who did it well, that, that they, they wouldn't put them on. It was live on that national television station. It's a clear demonstration. And, but growing up, I hear this all the time. Drivers tell you when they drink, 
they are much better drivers. That's why you have a lot of accidents. Some of them don't even know why they have those accidents. So I'm clear that why we are late, it said better late than ever, that this is absolutely essential. And I want to give my strong support as, uh, as I asked the member to clarify, because there are several sections of the bill where it says the minister and the minister. Well, which minister are we talking about? I think there's a need, the need for clarification of the minister responsible. I don't think every aspect of the bill is being referred to one minister because the minister responsible for the police is the prime minister. The minister responsible for health matters is the minister of health. The minister responsible for transport is the minister of communications and works. So I think the necessity for, um, I understand from the, tech, the legal pe persons here um, that they, it's clarified, but I think it's important. I was going through it and I wasn't sure myself. So I think the necessity for clarification, Mr. Speaker, is very important. So I, I give my full support to the second reading of this bill. Thank you, Honorable Prime Minister. Honorable Representative for the Talk of St. George. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise to give my full support and also would like to, to, to comment on the entire amendment or bill, but, but specifically to certain areas of substance, in my opinion. Mr. Speaker, we are a free society. We are an organized society. We are, by certain opinions, a laid-back society. And we are also, I think, unanimously agreed as a very sociable society and people, Mr. Speaker. And as recently been shown with Carnival, we are a law-abiding and disciplined society. But, Mr. Speaker, we are also a society in Grenada and in the region who, in our Sociable, sociable and friendly demeanor also consume alcohol. Mr. Speaker, not just in Grenada, but in the West Indies as a whole, as a Caribbean people. We celebrate. We celebrate life. We celebrate various occasions. And in most cases, alcohol is involved or the consumption of. Mr. Speaker, the majority of our citizens, the majority of our citizens adhere to a certain level of tolerance with respect to the consumption of alcohol. In fact, many of our citizens abstain from the consumption of alcohol for various reasons. And Mr. Speaker, we all have a right to freely coexist. But when a few when a few individuals who go beyond the limits of alcohol consumption threaten that individual right of the many to coexist, threaten that individual right of us all to traverse this island freely without risk or without increased risk to ourselves or to our connections, then it is the responsible thing for a government to pass certain legislation that will allow law enforcement to prevent as best as possible those who would threaten the safety of themselves or others by consuming above and beyond what is an acceptable international legal limit where one can be determined to be legally drunk or under the influence of alcohol and therefore unable to properly or safely operate a motor vehicle. And that is what this act seeks to bring forward late, but finally, that few are irresponsible individuals can no longer make our roads unsafe. It gives the law enforcement the tools, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it gives or points to the fact that those who have a right to celebrate, who need to consume alcohol for, as was said, to drown sorrows or for courage, or to feed an addiction, 
do not, their rights do not supersede the rights of the many others of us who can responsibly celebrate, responsibly drown our sorrows, and responsibly abstain or traverse the nation without being enumerated. So, Mr. Speaker, the Act specifically refers to, and I wanted to point out one or a couple other things. It speaks to a person who is actually found driving a vehicle at that point in time who is stopped. It speaks to a person who has been driving a vehicle and is then accosted or, 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 or presented to a police officer or a police officer presents himself after a person has driven a vehicle to a location. And it also speaks to a person who has committed an offense and in the police, basically in the police investigating that offense or coming to the scene of an accident and determining that they are under the influence above the limit as well or suspecting it allows the police to demand or request that breath test and blood test and in the case of prohibited drugs, a urine test at the scene or at a prescribed health center or health facility. It also allows the minister to nominate individuals, police officers and health providers to carry out that test. Mr. Speaker, it also speaks to a reasonable time for that test to be carried out in the three cases and a reasonable time for the results to be given in writing to the person who has been requested to take that test, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, it is long overdue, but I give full support to this part of the amendment, as I do to all of the amendments on this. I want to speak now to the amendment with respect to handheld devices. And just to add further to what my colleague has said in, in, in leading the presentation of the bill, and for the Prime Minister from the point of view that the bill, this amendment now differentiates in terms of the severity of charge between an individual using a handheld device in his private capacity driving a private vehicle and a greater charge for an individual driving a public service vehicle. So Mr. Speaker, and I I think we should get clarity when we're in committee that what exactly a public service vehicle is in terms of public transport or a vehicle owned by the public service, by the government. And Mr. Speaker, finally, on the issue of, of, of the immobilization of vehicles, I think specific and worthy of mention here is that the minister has the right to, to authorize individuals other than police officers to carry out the task of immobilizing vehicles in his own determination. And also, most importantly for public information, I think, neither a police officer or a person assisting a police officer nor the state will be liable for any motor vehicle under the control of the police force in accordance with this section for any damage sustained by such a vehicle during or as a result of the fitting onto the vehicle of an immobilizing device, unless such damage is caused intentionally or negligibly. So you park your vehicle where you're not supposed to park your vehicle and the clamp is put on properly and in doing so your vehicle gets damaged or gets damaged by another vehicle, or gets damaged by a passerby, or gets damaged with you trying to remove the clamp or so, the state is not liable for that damage. And I think that needs to be, to, to be mentioned. But Mr. Speaker, I fully support all three or four parts of this amendment. And, and, and I believe that across the length and breadth of the nation, there should be unanimous, if not significant, support to this. And I really would like to hear 
what someone has to say not in support to say that they encourage drinking and driving, that they do not think we should do that. So I look forward to the support fully. And also, we will be bringing an amendment in committee, but we will be monitoring closely with respect to the devices that are going to be used for breathalyzer and blood test. And the act gives the minister the ability to vary the level that we will set here today. And I think we, we need to appreciate that once these devices are, are fully functioning, there may be a need to vary up or down, or once we begin the enforcement of, as well as has happened in many other countries that have introduced uh, a blood alcohol limit and breath alcohol limit in drinking and driving, or for DUI, that there are variances as time goes on based on adherence and compliance. And finally, Mr. Speaker, on the issue of the handheld devices, as to whether, from the legal point of view, there is a possibility of a grace period between the law passing and the law being enforced, or whether it needs to be mentioned now while we're in committee, to give the public at large a reasonable time in which to acquire the various handheld devices, reasonable time, and then begin the enforcement of uh, no use of handheld devices. Sorry, give the public time to, to, to acquire wireless devices or wired so that we can begin to enforce appropriately. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Minister. Honorable Representative for St. Mark. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Side. Speaker, I rise in support of the Road Traffic Amendment Bill 2017 as presented by the member for St. George's Southeast. Mr. Speaker, I think it is high time that we move away from the non-scientific ways of determining whether someone is under the influence of alcohol or not. Because someone cannot walk in a straight line does not mean necessarily that that person is under the influence of alcohol or drugs. There are other circumstances, physiological, physical, and otherwise, that could cause someone to stagger that um, are not derived from alcohol intake. And therefore, we need to move away from the guessing thing and um, to introduce technical means whereby we can eliminate or minimize any reasonable doubt of someone being under the influence of alcohol. So I really welcome that. We have seen in Grenada an increase in road traffic accidents over the past few months and perhaps years. It is steadily increasing. Um, we are aware that alcohol is being take, drunk or taken in, uh, consumed in Grenada, perhaps a little bit more than we would like to see uh, for whatever reason. Um, and we are aware that sometimes the problems go as far as the loss of life or serious injury to persons where they lose life or limb or become incapacitated in any way. And therefore, um, not just alcohol, but other drugs as well. It is important that we move to address that. Mr. Speaker, um, I know the minister, the member for St. George Southeast has been very, oh, say, he has explained very effectively and efficiently this um, amendment. I just want to mention a couple things um, and reinforce one or two that I like very much, this issue of um, immobilizing vehicles when they are parked in places that are, that contravene the road traffic uh, act. And we see it every day. Going around a corner, holding your hand, and as you come around the corner, there's a vehicle parked there, and you're forced to go 
go around it and you are exposed to an accident from an oncoming vehicle. And we see that so many times. I only hope that in a place like Grenada, where everybody knows everybody and we're so small and everybody's related to everybody, that um, the police will be empowered to carry out their functions without fear or favor. Mr. Speaker, regardless to the amount we drink, and that is something that would have to be determined, it is mentioned here, but I want to bring in the idea of a designated driver. If people go out in an activity, there should be, however they, they decide who is the designated driver, by rotation or someone who does not drink alcohol or whatever, there should be someone who is designated to drive so that that person knows that for that, that particular time, they would minimize or perhaps not drink at all alcohol. Also, um, perhaps people could take the bus or walk or whatever, but avoid driving if they have exceeded or if they plan to exceed the amount that is determined to be acceptable. Mr. Speaker, I notice here that in section 62D, where it speaks, the way it provides for the police to officer to execute the breath test. I notice that it also speaks though in addition in 62C, where it mentions that if they're given the proper authority from the minister, they can also administer urine tests. I just want to advise a little bit of caution here because the taking of a urine sample could be a bit sensitive. Depending on where you are and how it is done, it could be a bit distasteful and, and disturbing for the, the person who is being examined. And while I am aware that these tests have to be done within a period of time, because as time passes, the level of alcohol, whether in the blood or wherever, would decrease over time. And therefore, it has to be done in the shortest possible time after the incident or the accident. But I am a little concerned about the taking of the urine test by the police. And I would prefer to see where it speaks to 60, section 62B, that both the urine test and the blood test be done by either a medical practitioner or a laboratory technician under the, um, the correct or the acceptable conditions and perhaps maybe um, acceptable conditions could be specified somewhere um, in, the, in, in some document. Um, so while I have no problem with the breathalyzer for the police, I think we should consider um, the problem that might ensue by taking a urine test sample. It would also mean that the Ministry of Health would have to be prepared to handle that. And I know sometimes the technicians have to be called out or picked up or brought in. We, that cannot be accommodated in this situation where you need to do a blood test or a urine test almost immediately after the incident. So I know the member for the town of St. George would have, and Minister for Health would have his hands full trying to deal with that. Mr. Speaker, finally, I just want to say that in looking at the offenses and the penalties that the relevant authority must look at rehabilitation. We cannot just um, hand out penalties and think that that is the end of it. But persons whose alcohol levels are found to be very high, either in one instance, and especially repeat offenders, there must be programs that would assist them in rehabilitation. And I keep saying alcohol only, but also any type of drugs, because in particular the urine tests and the blood tests would um, yield, um, could yield results outside of alcohol, other types of drugs as well. So I just want to suggest that 
in the interest of looking at the human being holistically. Not only must we look at offenses and penalties, but we must also look at adequate rehabilitation for those people. And the same way in terms of repeat offenders, I, I, I think that the, the penalty should increase by the number of, of offenses and also at some point in time if that person doesn't come to their senses with, even with, with technical support, counseling and so on, that that person should be debarred from driving for a period of time or maybe permanently. So I wish to add my support to this bill. Amendment. Thank you. Honorable Representative for St. George, Northeast. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise to give some support, I should say, not 100% support to this bill. Mr. Speaker, while the member for St. George Southeast was presenting this bill, I went onto YouTube and I pulled up a video that says, only in Grenada. In such a video, there is a motor vehicle parked on the airport that was clamped. It was going around, I think, about two years ago. And we saw in the video a, a gentleman came with a device and he proceeded to remove the clamp. You know that Denver clamp on the vehicle. And um, it went, uh, what we say, viral. Got a few, maybe million hits and uh, the caption only in Grenada. But I, I am I'm glad that we are moving to a point now where we would put common sense laws into place as to govern how we operate. But in this day and age of technology, the minister said, or the member said that um, a fine will be placed on someone who touch such devices. Mr. Speaker, it's coming to a point now, we do not have to touch the device to remove it anymore. If you have the technology and the know-how, you can remove it without even touching it. I, I think the, he would appreciate the technology that exists. So we have to look at that. But Mr. Speaker, you know, I am very <coughs> disappointed in some aspects of this bill. We are talking about road safety. And we spoke about the amount of deaths over the past few months or years. And I, I was hoping, including in this bill, not only driving under the influence, but for instance, riding the motorbike without helmet. That is, I mean, if you look at the condition of the Grenada Road these days, to me, any time you jump on a motorbike, it's almost like a death sentence. Oh, check the record for the last three years. And you would see the amount of fatalities by people riding the motorbike without a helmet, Mr. Speaker. I think this is something that should be and must be addressed in this country if we are serious about road safety. Mr. Speaker, I look at it again, talking about road safety, and I spoke to it before. We as a government and people invest in our roads time and time again, and there is never enough investment in our roads for safety. Case in point, Mr. Speaker, government to the Ministry of Work spend thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars to erect barricades and guardrails. A driver under some influence or by no influence at all recklessly gets into an accident, knock out the barricade, destroy the guardrail, and there ain't no consequence after that. Who pays for it? The taxpayers of our country. Why is it that if they destroy the guardrails, they knock out the light pole, they destroy the barricades, isn't the insurance company or the driver should be responsible for replacing such? 
What about the new wall that the government just built, $200,000, it is knocked out, and it is left like that? The police can't do anything because there are no laws in place. If we are talking about road safety and development of this country, these are things that must be addressed. Mr. Speaker, we're moving on. In terms of road safety, a man is caught once, he's fine. He's caught twice, he's fine. He's caught three times. How many times do we have to go through this before the driver's license is suspended or it is revoked forever? I know, Mr. Speaker, I, I live in Texas. I was educated there for 10 years. Three moving violations in one year and your driver's license is suspended. Three moving violations in one year and your driver's license is suspended. So this must be taken into, in, into consideration to Mr. Speaker. And moving violations do not have to be the vehicle. You do not have to be under the influence. But a moving violation can be considered if you're on a red light or if you're on, uh, under the influence, or if you're driving over the speed limit, this is considered to be moving violations. But Mr. Speaker, something concerns me too, that the minister in presenting the bill, he says that if you are driving a motor vehicle, and sitting here as a layman, maybe the framers might help me here, at what time do you become the driver of a vehicle? So if I'm driving a vehicle and I pulled over and decide to answer the phone while I, I am on the, 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 the shoulder, am I not still the driver? Or should we say when the vehicle is mobile that we use our handheld devices? Or, so it, it, if it is there, but I know he was interchanging between a mobile vehicle and, a, and the driver of a vehicle. And, and this must be made straight in the law. Mr. Speaker, I'm looking at it, and, and I believe there are, we have to probably fine tune this law as to include or not include, because he mentioned to me, to us here in the House, that maybe there should be some exceptions for emergencies. Maybe the police or the, the ambulance driver and, and maybe ENT or whatever, it might be understood. But Mr. Speaker, if you are in a position and you have your vehicle have to be mobile, cannot you too, Mr. Speaker, have an emergency? It is possible. So it, it, one has to, one must look at this. Mr. Speaker, in terms of, of developing our road safety, we can just start and stop here. And I believe the time has come when we have to look at it, not just now, but the source. And something that I, I believe that the presenter of the bill explained, and it's something that we have to look at too, Mr. Speaker, critically in this country, is the presence of derelict vehicles on the side of the road for years. Mr. Speaker, sometimes we, well, our roads in Grenada are very narrow. And I can tell you of a place now where they, they told me that vehicle has been there sitting. Nobody can do anything about it. And the vehicle might be sitting there 10, 11, 12 years old for, for the time. Mr. Speaker, this too is a concern for road and health safety in Grenada. And if the laws are there, it must be implemented. If it is not there, I think it is high time for us to move in that direction. So I would support it, and I would support it with even further and deeper amendments to include this too, to include helmets, and to include other things that will make our public, our Grenadian citizen safer in this country of ours. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you kindly. Honorable Representative for St. George Northeast. Honorable Representative for the Town of St. George, you wanted to. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, yes. 
Mr. Speaker, just to, to comment and add some clarity based on comments that have, have been made, I want to thank um, the Honourable Sister from St. Mark's for, for, for bringing in, as she usually does in this House and at other places, that human element and that human concern for individuals and to, to tell her, rest assured, in section 9 of 62C, it says, Minister may, by regulation, approve a device and procedures to be used and applied for the purpose of carrying out a urine test. But I think based on what she says, it means that the minister, whoever that minister is, needs to take into consideration what she has said and make sure that the privacy um, of the individual is also respected in that procedure that the minister will prescribe. So I want to thank her for that. The comments made by, by a representative for St. George Northeast, simply to say that the Road Traffic Act, parts not amended in this, 62, 61 actually of the Road Traffic Act, or 62, says and allows that a person on the first offense they can, their driver's license can be taken away for one year by the court on the second offense for five years on a second offense and gives the ability for it to be removed by a court based on the offense. So now that we have put in the limits and the ability for the police to determine what is an offense with respect to driving, driving under the influence, which never existed before, it allows the court now to, as it was given the power before, but not the instrument, so to speak. It allows the court now to, to remove or take away that driver's license in the first offense for one year, second offense for five years or more. Mr. Speaker, on the issue of, of helmets, I too would have liked to have seen, and I know I ha we had discussions to see the helmet legislation. While it exists in the Road Traffic Act, there is a small an amendment that needs to be made to make it properly enforceable. So, so I agree with, with my brother on that. Um, but the handheld devices it speak specifically to driving and the law states specifically that an individual may pull aside, come to a stop or park and use their handheld device at that point. But while in motion or operating that vehicle in motion, they are not too use that handheld device, and the amendment also specifically allows the minister to, to determine, and it says, limitations on the application of this code, drivers of ambulances, fire service vehicles, and police service vehicles. They are, from this amendment, um, exempted from that rule with the assumption that in certain instances in the carrying out of their duties in an emergency, they may need to use a cell phone or handheld device while driving and further allows for any other person or class of persons as prescribed by the minister. And the minister would have to give the proper justification for that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honorable, honorable uh, member for the town of St. George, I thank you for that clarification. Um, although we had to step aside of the standing orders pertaining to the debate on the bills. So while I would permit you, Honorable Representative for St. George Northeast, is there something specific you wish to? Yes, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, you noticed that I was listening to the member for the Tongue of St. George intently because he was reading the document. But Mr. Speaker, my question is, and the question to this honorable house, how much time have I had to peruse such a document? Okay, thank you very much, honorable representative. Leader of government business. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank all my colleagues for their contribution and to simply make some comments on some points uh, that were raised. The one, the first is the which minister responsible, the parent act referred to the minister for works, in particular to do with the police 
and authorizing the police is the Minister for National Security, as is the norm. But in any area of ambiguity, Mr. Speaker, it's minister and minister in cabinet. It therefore means that once you're going to regulation and once you're doing certain things, even to get this law done, that the Minister for National Security would come to do something on this bill and will make an order or so forth. And that order must involve legal affairs and it must involve the cabinet. Similarly, the Minister for Health and the Minister for Works will not reduce the limit, the number of um, micrograms per liter of blood. But even if the order is signed by the minister, it means the minister and cabinet, the entire cabinet will be involved. So, Mr. Speaker, we think that this is, is, is clear enough from the interpretations act and just from the practice of minister and cabinet. Secondly, Mr. Speaker, we look on the effect of the driving population and, and as such, there could be some concern that when this comes into effect, as soon as it's public, published in the Gazette, it's law. But um, there is a feeling that some people may want some time. I think that is an administrative component of the, the police in really saying, you know, making an announcement on the radio, giving the first person a warning, etc. if the crime is, or if the offense it's not too dismal, et cetera, et cetera. But we believe that maybe it should be left up to the, the police and, and the interaction with the public, the public relations and uh, humane treatment. That if something has to be done severely, then it will be done, Mr. Speaker. And I've noted from the person on the transport board, the officer on the transport board, he has alluded to this. The law gives the police the power to tow away. It also gives the police the power to put on the immobilizing device. But if you're packed in such a bad position, should you put on, should the police put on the device or tow you away? Because you, the vehicle, could be causing accidents as well. So and I've heard him say that in such an occasion, while they do have the power for the clamps, as we call them, emphasis will be given to the real vehicle packed in the most dismal position to be towed away. Maybe they'll put a the clamp on it first if they can't move it, but the ideal situation is to tow the vehicle away, Mr. Speaker. This, again, the handheld devices, Mr. Speaker, we have been speaking about this for a long time. Remember, there is no calling this amendment into effect. As soon as it is gazetted, it will be in effect. And so the police, together with the Ministry of Works, um, should be embarking as of tomorrow, God's willing, on a public campaign. Young entrepreneurs should be immediately bringing into Grenada all the necessary electronic devices so that you can sell to the young people, sell to the middle aged, sell to all drivers. And I think this is one area that we can give whatever small relief we, we can on as a government to let people get these things. And what we will require mainly is not to use the phone because the older vehicles, Mr. Speaker, do not have the hand, the steering wheel controls. So most people will have something that you clamp on the board that will try or will tend to make the person use the hand. So first, the device plus the interconnection, I think these units should be sold as of now on. Don't use a hand, the vehicle will be on the phone, either connect by wire or either wireless connection. And, and this is the way to go, Mr. Speaker, rather than saying you have three months from now on before you do such a thing, um, before the police will start implementing the laws, Mr. Speaker. And I want to again thank my colleagues for their contribution, very meaningful contribution. The Minister for National Security, with respect to the urine test, as mentioned by my colleague, the Minister of National Security could authorize a police officer to do a urine test, not a blood test, but a urine test, the breathalyzer always for the police. In which case, therefore, we expect the Minister for National Security 
to really authorize a police man or woman who was or who still is a medical practitioner. Maybe that person is a nurse or have training, or even if they do not have it now, but perhaps to ensure that they have it, particularly with respect to the urine and the point raised by my colleagues, Mr. Speaker. And that is a very, very important point. How do you treat with a person who may be under the influence? How do you get them to urinate close by? That means a lot of skills, Mr. Speaker. But a policeman cannot do it without being authorized by the Minister for National Security. And so the emphasis for carrying out this in the humane, in the best way, definitely rests with the Minister for National Security and not with the police force per se. And as a member of cabinet, I'm sure she will make her voice heard very clearly so that the operations of this amendment will be to the benefit of all concerned. I recommend, Mr. Speaker, the amendment for its second reading. Honorable members, the question is that the Road Traffic Amendment Bill 2017 be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Of the contrary opinion say nay. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. A bill for an act shortly entitled Road Traffic Amendment Bill 2017. Leader of Government Business. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move that the House resolves itself into a committee of the whole House to consider the bill clause by clause. Honorable members, the question is that this Honorable House resolve itself into a committee of the whole House to consider the bill clause by clause. Those who have that opinion say aye. Aye. Of the contrary opinion say nay. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Honorable members, this Honorable House now stands in committee. Clause 2, Amendment of Section 30 of Principal Act. Honorable members, the question is that Clause 2 forms part of the bill. Those who have that opinion say aye. Of the contrary opinion say nay. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clause 3, insertion of Section 30A of Principal Act. Honorable members, the question is that Clause 3 forms part of the bill. Those who have that opinion say aye. Does the contrary opinion say nay? I think the eyes have it. The eyes have it. Clause 4, amendment of section 62 of Principal Act. Honorable members, the question is that clause 4 forms part of the bill. Mr. Chairman, um, there is one amendment on clause 4. One amendment uh, on clause 4. Paragraph 6. Where it says... Uh, in the case of a breath, 35 micrograms of alcohol in 100 millimeters of breath, that should change to 70. In the case of a breath, 35 micrograms of alcohol, that should be changed to 70. Change 35 to 70. And in paragraph in B, change 80 to 160. So we're saying they, should have, they could have a little more than what was prescribed? Was prescribed here, yes. Okay. But again, the, the minister has the authority to vary okay. that. And I remember the question is that clause four as amended forms part of the bill. Those who have that opinion say aye. aye. Of the contrary opinion say nay. I think the ayes have it, the ayes have it. Clause five, insertion of section 62B to 62D, the principal act. And I remember the question is that clause five forms part of the bill. Those who have that opinion say aye. Of the contrary opinion say nay. I think the eyes have it. The eyes have it. 
Clause 6, renumbering of Section 62B of Principal Act as Section 62E. And I remember the question is that Clause 6 forms part of the bill. Those who have that opinion say aye. aye. Of the contrary opinion say nay. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clause 7, insertion of Section 77A to 77D to Principal Act. And I remember the question is that Clause 7 forms part of the bill. Those who have that opinion say aye. aye. Of the contrary opinion say nay. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clause 8, amendment to third schedule to Principal Act. And I remember the question is that Clause 8 forms part of the bill. Those who have that opinion say aye. aye. Of the contrary opinion say nay. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clause 1, short title. And I remember the question is that Clause 1, short title, forms part of the bill. Those who have that opinion say aye. Of the contrary opinion say nay. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Leader of Government Business. Mr. Chairman, I beg to move that the House resume and the Chairman of the Committee reports progress on the bill. Honorable Member, the question is that this Honorable House resumes and the Chairman of the Committee reports progress on the bill. Those who have that opinion say aye. aye. Of the contrary opinion say nay. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Honorable Members, this House now resumes. I have to report that the bill was considered by a committee of the whole House and passed with amendments. Leader of Government Business. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I beg to move that the Chairman's report be adopted. Honorable Members, the question is that the Chairman's report be adopted. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Of the contrary opinion say nay. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Leader of Government Business. Speaker, I beg to move the third reading of the bill. Honorable members, the question proposed is that the bill be read a third time. Honorable members, the question is that the bill be read a third time and passed. Those who have that opinion say aye. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Just uh, on the third reading of the bill, just uh, to comment that with the bill giving us the minister the authority to make regulations with respect to the type of device, immobilizing device, that we'll be working um, with the police to look at the electronic medium that is just immobilizing the cars. All of them have immobilizers now. So instead of putting a clamp on us there, you've got a computer, you've got close to your vehicle. And I think the police now does have a command station somewhere. They move with this in the vehicle. You simply cannot turn it off. You respect, turn it on. You respect it off your key position. And um, basically to say, Mr. Speaker, together with the regulations, the bill already gives the minister the authority to make regulations with respect to the helmets and so for the motor vehicles. I believe with this amendment now, we can move forward for not complete, but nearly 98% uh, safety on our own. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honorable members, the question is that the bill be read a third time and passed. Those who have that opinion say aye. aye. Of the contrary opinion say nay. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Honorable, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Go ahead, Mr. Speaker. A bill for an act shortly entitled Road Traffic Amendment Bill 2017. Honorable members, I wish to suggest that we adjourn at this time and have our lunch and return at uh, 2.30. Our lunch would be taken right here. Leader of Government Business. Oh, thank you, um, Mr. Speaker. We just not to go against, but because you have already made your decision, but there were hands on the floor asking to implore you to move ahead, but um, you have already made your decision for lunch. <laughs> I find 
they were looking hungry to eh? So honorable members will adjourn until 2.30. Uh, honorable members, this house now stands adjourned until 2.30.